Sir Jack Thrubman has been the uh, tech op, uh, technical operator. Naya Saravanchi has been the uh, visual producer. Tommy Bateson, the uh, assistant producer, answering all the calls as well. Thank you to him. Parik Birmingham has been a brilliant video editor. There's been loads of video today, obviously, coming in from all parts of the world. And Parik has been dealing with all of that. So thank you to him. And thanks also to the weekend editor, Dan Warren, for all of his uh, thoughts. Um, uh, someone says, Peter, what you've just done to that man is disgraceful. You should be sacked. I think that is uh, perhaps the caller who was on a little bit earlier. I just ran out, of, ran out of time. Happily have him on tomorrow. No problem. But I needed to talk to Nick Dubois about what was coming up on his uh, show. Absolutely not cutting anybody off. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, please do join me then. Nick Dubois is next. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. And welcome to the show. Thanks to Peter Cardwell, as ever. The best listen you can get at the weekend. I'm sure I've annoyed myself there because I should really say I am. But always a pleasure to follow him. Now, uh, as you know, the goal here is to have as much conversation with you as possible. But I do like to help that conversation along the way. So uh, there's some big, big things going on around the world. We'll be coming to those, I can assure you of that. And in fact, my first guest for the first hour is Alistair Burt, uh, who himself was not just um, uh, a Minister of State in the Foreign Office, but actually had a responsibility for the Middle East. Not that he's to blame for everything there. So we will be talking about the potential of the Iran-Israel escalation uh, that Joe Biden warned us about only nine hours ago that was going to happen. But I can't overlook, of course, the big domestic story, which is all about the Labour Party deputy leader, Angela Rayner. Now, lots has been said about that. So what I really want to ask is uh, how much do these Angela Rayner allegations and the story, if you like, matter to you? 0344 499 1000. There's a reason I'm doing that, because I kicked off a mini Twitter storm this morning when I said... Whether Angela Rayner is guilty or not about uh, either the issue over where her residence was for voting purposes or whether she has not paid all her tax, and we don't know if she's guilty or not, I think she's guilty of rank hypocrisy in some of her statements since. Call, uh, why she won't put out her tax affairs advice when she demanded Conservatives who came under criticism for their tax affairs did. Uh, and there's a list of other things. Uh, but at the end of the day, the Twitter storm kicked off. The answers fell into three camps. Hey, nothing to see here. It's almost as if those supporters of Angela Rayner, obviously mainly on the left, were saying, uh, OK, we've got an organised campaign to defend her here. The second one, you wicked Tories, obviously I was included in that, you have no right to make any allegations here. There's nothing to see here. And you are more corrupt than she isn't, if you get what I mean. And the third category very much came into, well, she deserves what's coming to her. But not many of those, I hasten to add. So I'm just really asking, how, how much do these allegations matter to you? What do they mean to you? Or are you more concerned with many of the other issues, not just going on around the world, but going on in your own life? 0344 499 1000. Plus, we should be talking about some other things. Uh, not least that this Monday, uh, ping pong begins, uh, not the sport, in the House of Lords and the House of Commons over the Rwanda deal. Will it come to its rather torturous journey through the House of Lords? In fact, its torturous journey for quite a long time. And will the planes ever get off the ground? What's going to happen in Parliament this week? Again, my first guest will be able to give us his views on that. Plus, WhatsApp reducing the age of permission to use the group down to 13, to use this social media down to 13, seems to be putting cash before kids' well-being. How dangerous is the libertarian use of uh, social media? What is the risk to our children? And have WhatsApp uh, put profits uh, before the protection of young people? 0344 499 1000. Uh, and there's going to be a vote to ban smoking. Basically, ban it. This is it. We're going for it. Banning it, starting at a certain age. According, this, I think, comes to the House of Commons on the Monday. I'm not entirely sure, but it's certainly Monday or Tuesday. And there is the possibility of a rebellion. Now, instinctively, I'm one of those Tories who doesn't like to ban things. But I have to ask, what's wrong with trying to ban cigarettes? 0344 499 1000. All that and more coming up here with me, Nick Dubois. Plus, of course, as you know, if you want to ring in on something that you feel we have not covered, that you is so important to you, I'm more than happy to have that conversation. Even if we disagree, we can do it respectfully. 0344 499 1000. You can send a WhatsApp as well. You can send a WhatsApp voice message. You know I love technology. This is all a bit of, bit of fun to me when they come in as well. Or you can text your word, uh, uh, text with the word talk in front of it to 87222 or tweet at TalkTV or at Nick Dubois. 
But if you could just refrain a little bit on the, uh, the trail that was running this morning, it'll give me time to have a rest after the show and not try and answer everyone. But kick the conversation off. I'm very pleased to welcome an old colleague uh, of ours. Well, I shouldn't say old. That's a bit unfair, isn't it? Um, Alistair Burke. Long-standing. Long Long-standing colleagues. That's nice right. to see you, Nick. Nice to see what you're doing now. Great pleasure to be in. Well, uh, listen, there's so many uh, things for us to, to kick off about. But uh, let me ask you the question of the day, if I, if I may, that we're, we're asking. Um, how much does the Angela Ray, Rayner allegations in, mean to you, but also your opinion of, of how much of a, a drama this really is? In all honesty, it doesn't mean much to me. Um, firstly, I think it emphasises the personality side of politics. It appeals to activists on both sides in that those will rush to Angela Rayner's defence. and others. Who, who I, sh I should add, by the way, I, I didn't. This, is, this just shows the danger of being a politician turned broadcaster is, of course, deputy leader of the Labour yes. Party and, and, and is in trouble for these allegations against her about... Absolutely. Um, but as I say, it, uh, it, it appeals to the activists who will pick over it no end on both sides. One side alleging that there is an unfair uh, um, hunting down of an individual, um, maybe partly because of her background, and others will say, well, hold on a minute, look what she's said herself in the past and all that. I don't think it emphasises the, the policy areas of uh, politics, which I think the public are most interested in. The public want to know who's going to fix their public services, who's going to help them with cost of living, who's going to keep the economy straight, who's going to keep them safe. Now, it is part of politics, and there's no point being you know, Pollyanna about it or, uh, or, or some other character that always sees the good in everything. Life is life. Um, I, I think in political terms, the mistake is that once a story is running, you need to shut it down as quickly mm. as possible. But they've made a mistake there, haven't they? If they Labour, were, I mean. Yes, yeah. if there was evidence available that would deal with the allegations and shut it down, the sooner it's produced, the better. Uh, and I think that's the point that the Labour Party has now reached. They're realising that and that they must get to because once the issue has been raised in public, there's got to be an answer to the questions that have been raised one way or another. And the sooner that is done, the better. But all in all, it, it, it will simply produce, I'm sure, more efforts by Labour activists to find something that a Conservative has done. And Conservatives and tax, uh, it's not a particularly good story to be to be batting on. So, again, it will it will colour the pages of political activism and make everybody cross, but I think the vast majority of the general public will say, please address the issues that really matter to us rather than get caught up in this. So let me just test that a little bit with you, because uh, my, my argument is that the handling of this does reek of hypocrisy. Not, not, she hasn't been found guilty of anything, so in many ways it's not about the charges. But I, with the very contrasting story, but nevertheless about tax on uh, former briefly, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sadim Nahawi. He got in lots of trouble for his tax affairs. Um, this is what she wrote. She said, uh, his story about his tax affairs doesn't add up. Well, that's been said about the allegations against Andrew Arena. And she added in her vi video that his position was untenable. But every pound of tax, she said, that is not delivered to the Chancellor and to the Exchequer means that it damages our public services. Every pound. Now, she may only be potentially have avoided potentially up to about 1500 pounds there is a principle at stake here with politicians and tax isn't it that, that should be challenged yes i think that's perfectly right uh, and that's why i said that the earlier an allegation like this can be dealt with the better if a mistake was made and an individual comes forward mm. as a number of conservative uh, mps have done and said i didn't get this right this is what we owe and we'll we'll pay then the job is done. If people try and evade it, then that becomes more difficult. Uh, but as I say, the, the nature of the story and the way in which it, it, it's grown legs, yes, I think it's an error in relation to the handling. But, I, but again, I don't think it does politics very much good. People will be on the lookout for the next story. And hypocrisy, well, that gets banded about on mm. all sides. It, it doesn't help us focus on the things that I think really matter. To okay, people. well, I stand chastised on no, that no. score. But, it, but. No, the, the, the point of these programmes mm. and the point of your listeners making comments is we don't all see the things from everybody seeing the same point of view. And it, it, it's, it's like those exam questions when you say there isn't actually a right answer. Give your opinion. And people's opinions are valid uh, mm. on this. People, anyone who's, who has been 
in, in a position of paying more tax than they felt they ought to will be cross if people uh, are seen one not to whatever. one pound or a million pounds. Um, so people are entitled to a view. But all in all, uh, as I say, I think there are elements to this that look, uh, you look, you know, quite vindictive. And it Isn't only opens the gates to the next one. I, I mean, uh, 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 that's the nature of politics. But in an election year, yes. particularly, everything is viewed through the lens of the um, the, the elect uh, of the potential election coming up, and this is just red meat. Uh, uh, now we can't well, talk about individual well, seats, but in a local yeah, but, election period but, but as well. Red meat to who? Red meat to the people who read about politics mm. all the time, take it very seriously, talk about it endlessly. That's not necessarily everybody out there who will be coming to a conclusion about how to vote. Uh, and I think sometimes activists do get very concerned about going down their own rabbit holes. They read it, their friends read it, well, their friends egg them on, on both sides. Alistair, you've made exactly the point behind my question as I'm asking. Exactly the point that Alistair Burt here, former um, uh, Minister of State at the Foreign Office, is making. And asking you how much do the Rayner allegations matter to you? Because I think those who are very engaged in politics, actually, probably it does matter um, for all sorts of reasons. But to you, if in the real world outside of Westminster, let me know your views. 03444991000. Um, if it's okay with you, Alistair, um, I'm going to take our first call. It's Dean in Wales. And I think, Dean, you want to talk about this very subject. Hi, yes, I would. Um, basically, um, I, I voted Tory last, uh, last election, but that's besides the point. The thing is, Angela Rayner was happy enough to say what she said about the Tories that they should quit, they should all this, even though, even though they haven't been convicted of anything. So, so it, the question is, if she lives by the sword, she should also die by the sword. Uh, Alistair, let me, you heard that, I hope, did you? Yeah, yes, yes no, you did. I, I uh, you've, got a, you've got a Tory here, you've got a former, very senior member of the party, former Minister of State. Let's hear what Alistair has to say. Um, I think Dean will speak for a good number of people. Um, MPs, all MPs put things on the record. If you challenge your opponents on one particular thing and it turns out that you're guilty of the same thing, exactly. Um, and if you charge that people should lose their positions, then that's the position you must um, be prepared to accept yourself. My understanding is that in a statement last night, Angela Rayner said just that. She said, if I am found to have committed a criminal offence, then I will go. So that is a recognition that she's uh, recognising the standard that's being set. Um, and that will be a, a valid view held by a number of people. Dean, uh, just just a, a quick question. I, I mean, we don't know if she's guilty or not, but do you feel she's been hypocritical by not, for example, relieve, uh, re releasing tax information, or, or do you think that's fair enough? No, no, no. Right. The thing is, you don't release anything if you have something to hide. And that's a conclusion a lot of people are going to draw. Dean, thank you for kicking our conversation off. That was Dean in Wales making some very good points. I, I said a second ago, uh, Alistair, a lot of things have been looked through the prism of the election. You have had, and, and there's a bit of a twist at the end of this question, but let me give it context. You have served in Parliament a considerable number of years, both in opposition. You served in David Cameron's government. Uh, I think you represented three seats in all because of boundary changes. Two. Uh, it was two, was it? Yes. Um, and uh, you've been deputy chief whip. In fact, you were the first deputy chief whip I ever, I ever met, and I found it quite terrifying at the time. Me? Terrifying? Yes, you were, because you uh, sat us in a room and gave all the new boys, basically, um, and this was before the election, and you, you asked us a question that we all answered positively to. And then you said, now, who of you want to be ministers? And there was a horrible pause as those thought about whether they should declare whether they Correct. wanted to be a minister. I kept my hand firmly down at that point. And you immediately pounced on the issue and you said, this is where uh, ambition can rock unity. And you came in and gave us a speech about unity. Yeah, but let me go back to that question because we, we've got enough time and let me deal with it. Um, when I was in opposition, I had just come out of a spell of losing the election mm. in 1997. I was a headhunter for a few years. I came back into Parliament. One of the things I appreciated while I was out in a commercial world was the value of the people who work for organisations. They are the real, the real force behind any company. Uh, and you come back into Parliament and MPs are not seen in the same way by the political machines. A question I devised was exactly that, to talk to somebody and say to them, what is it that you really want to do with your time in Parliament? Now, there are two answers. 
One is the member says, uh, the new member says, oh, well, it's been my ambition all my life to be here, to serve the people of West Barsetshire. I'm going to do that the rest of my life. Is that a good answer? Does that demonstrate uh, someone's commitment to their people? Or is, it, uh, an, or is it someone who says to the whips, that's great, this bloke's got no ambition and, you know, can do what he likes? Or does the individual say, do you know what, I think I would really like to be Secretary of State mm. of Defence. Mm. What does that say? Does that say the individual has ambition or we've got to watch this one? The correct answer is, in fact, the second one. Someone who wants to be Secretary of State for Defence and the correct answer and response from the whips and the answer that I would have given to that question is, that's fine. Neither you or I know whether you've got the capacity to do this. But while you're here, you go on the appropriate committees, we'll watch you, we'll see what progress you make. You'll be doing one or two other things as well. And when the time comes to select the Cabinet of the future, you and we will know whether you've got the capacity to do this. But you will get your chance. No one should leave Parliament without feeling they haven't had their chance. Fair enough. And that was what I wanted to develop amongst the core of MPs. But, and here's the rub. You talk, uh, you, I, you, I talked about this point about unity and you said you'd come with a background when obviously the party had had some difficulties Up to as 1997, well. yeah, up absolutely. To 1997. You look and at the now, Conservative Party now, you see it's divided, yep. you see it's in an unholy mess. You were actually expelled from the party on a matter of principle and you were welcomed back into that party, which, you know, at the time I thought this was a bad move when they did it, I'll be honest with you, when they, they took the whip away. So you've really had quite a journey. But when you look at the Conservative Party now and what is going to stand before the election, it's not the same Conservative Party you joined. Do you think you could vote Conservative at this election? <laughs> well, there's a whole series of questions to unpack there, but I... I, 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 I'll, I I'll, go, I'll start with the last one first, if you like. <laughs> um, I voted for Festus Akambu Pizzoye in the by mid -election. beds by-election because of where I lived. Um, and I voted for Festus because I like Festus. He's a PCC candidate. He's going to do very well. I thought he's uh, good news for the Conservative Party. I would vote for Festus again, but he's not standing this time. I don't know who will be the candidate. Uh, the candidate will make a difference to me. Um, uh, when I left North East Bedfordshire, um, uh, I said to, to the Whips, um, I'm very keen to support the person who will come uh, after me, providing you're not going to parachute somebody in who I think is a danger to the Conservative Party and the would-be Conservative individuals uh, that I would not have voted for. Um, and uh, that remains the case today. Uh, as, as far as the broader question about the party is concerned, no, it's not the same. But then I, I joined the party in 1970 when I was 15. I wouldn't expect the party to be the same. I became a Member of Parliament in 1983. Parties evolve. The, the Labour Party that I fought then wanted to come out of the common market and didn't support the, uh, uh, the nuclear deterrent and all that. Uh, they're different now, we're different now. Uh, but three things are needed for a long-standing government to lose. Two outside the control of the Conservative Party, one within its control. Firstly, that feeling it's time for a change. There's very little you can do about Which it. Which we've got. Is it there? You bet it's there. Secondly is the nature of the opposition leader. The public will not vote for an opposition or a leader they don't think is ready for it, no matter what the circumstances are. They didn't vote for Neil Kinnock, for Michael Foote or for Jeremy Corbyn to be the, the Prime Minister. Would they have voted for John Smith? Perhaps. Would they vote for uh, Keir Starmer? Yes, they certainly will. The third thing is the nature of the Conservative Party. If the party is at odds with itself, my experience in the lead up to 97 was the public say, uh, fight yourselves, but don't try and govern the country at the same time. Uh, That's where I think we are at the moment. So um, Alistair's answered that question. He's going to vote depending on the candidate. Would you be voting Conservative at this next general election? 0344 499 1000. If you've got a question for Alistair on the state of the Conservative Party, uh, why it's losing so many voters to reform, um, join that conversation, 0344 499 1000. And my main question of the day is how much do the Angela Rayner allegations matter to you? I think they matter. What do you think? 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl. 
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back. I'm here with Alistair Burke, former Minister of State in the Foreign Office, which is pretty timely because uh, I can't think of more dangerous times uh, than we've been living in. Uh, if, you've got, uh, if you want to talk in the meantime about, first of all, the Angela Rayner affair, which I can see many of you are ringing in about, does it matter to you? Uh, feel free to do that, 0344 499 1000. Quick couple of messages. Uh, Angela Rayner, she should produce the papers asked for. If guilty, pay up and resign. Also, stop telling us about her poor childhood, says Susie. Quite a lot of politicians want to tell us that, and I think bus drivers is normally their parents. Their father was a bus driver is the most popular one. Uh, Rayner, Nick, it matters very much. She is probably the next deputy prime minister, and she must be beyond reproach. This is the second time she's offered to resign if found guilty. This is Durham. I think that's the allegations over the beer, all over again, and she clearly had been assured no action will be taken. I believe Starmer and Burnham have her back covered. It stinks, says Barry from North Yorkshire. Angela uh, is wrong. I think she's a liar and a politician. I push back every time the natural association is made between if you're a politician, you're a liar. You're not. Have politicians lied? Of course. Lots of people have as well. But I, I, you know me, I'll never subscribe to the general theory, all politicians are bad. Uh, and it's like saying all police officers are bad. We know there's rotten eggs in there, some really rotten eggs. So I'm always wary of going down that road. Turning to international matters, Joe Biden, uh, overnight for our benefit, saying he absolutely anticipates a retaliation, an in intervention from Iran against Israel because of Israel's attack uh, on Lebanon uh, and, uh, and Iranian interests there. We've just seen today, uh, it's not really um, breaking news now, it happened a little while ago, of a reported attack uh, on a ship 
uh, Israeli registered ship, as I understand it, um, by Iran or proxies of Iran. Still, details are emerging. Uh, do you think this is beginning to look like a substantial escalation in the Middle East, or are we look are we perhaps getting a bit too worried? The markets went haywire yesterday in America, financial markets, because they really suspect the conflict is about to escalate big time. Um, there were very, uh, there were dramatic uh, announcements in Israel as well as the United States anticipating uh, almost an immediate attack. I think it was a run on the banks in, uh, in Israel. Dire warnings were given and of course Israel has seen attacks in its northern area from Lebanon as well as what's happened in, in Gaza. But my short answer to your question is, is a major conflagration uh, anticipated shortly. My answer would be not yet. There are many constraints in the region against an all-out conflict between Iran and Israel. Those are the sheer cost in human terms and physical terms of what such an attack would mean. Um, uh, Forgive me, that doesn't seem to have stopped Israel in Gaza, though, where there have been obviously huge deaths. So. Uh, Iran is not Gaza, being okay. very blunt uh, about it. The uh, the situation in Gaza, let's leave that to one side if we may. Sure, I'm very sure. happy no, no, to come absolutely. back to it. But uh, a direct attack by Iran on Israel itself and uh, vice versa would change the nature of the region very significantly. Uh, Iran wants regional dominance, wants regional influence, but it's extremely wary of moving beyond its proxies. It has proxies in uh, Lebanon through Hezbollah, it has proxies in uh, acting for it in, in Syria and in Iraq, uh, and of course the relationship with Hamas, a lesser with, with the Houthi. But it's avoided an all-out confrontation. Equally, the Israelis have avoided it. Um, Nobody wants, least of all the partners in the region, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, they have made approaches to Iran over the past year. Mm. They don't want a confrontation. Someone reckoned that the first day of a war in the Middle East would cost the UAE a trillion dollars. Nobody wants to do this. Um, but the risk of a miscalculation is there. What tends to happen is after uh, the raid we saw uh, the other day uh, by Israel on Iranian interests in Syria, which was the bombing of a diplomatic mission, which was outside mm -hmm. the normal rules, mm -hmm. there was bound to be a response from Iran. The important issue is, is that response proportionate? And the seizure of a ship, but not an attack on Israel itself, would seem to come within that uh, limit of proportion. Could it, could it develop into a hostage situation or something like it that? Could. It could. It depends on how long it goes on. It could change the nature the nature of things. But it's different from an, an attack on Israeli soil. And maybe that is Iran saying, you can't mess with us, so we're going to take some reciprocal action, but nobody wants to send the balloon up completely. So could I ask you, just on, on that point, someone like Joe Biden, the President of America, someone like Joe Biden, stands up and basically says, we are going to back Israel. We are, you know, do not attack. This was part of the message sending to say, be proportionate. Yes, it was. It? And that is where it comes into, into Gaza. It's clear that President Biden has significant differences with Prime Minister Netanyahu as to how the operation in Gaza is being conducted, as many do. But he wanted to make it clear in case anybody misinterpreted this, this is the Americans breaking away from Israel. No, it's not. America is absolutely, as the United Kingdom, fundamentally in support of the existence of the state of Israel and against those who would threaten that existence. But that does not stop and, and should not stop legitimate criticism of the state of Israel, nor should it stop efforts to try and descale all this. Some, sometime, somewhere, something will go badly wrong if these states mm -hmm. keep chipping away at well, each let's, other. Well, let's come back to that if we may the Middle East generally in a second. I just have to read some breaking news, then I'm going to take Thomas's call in Lincoln. Um, sad breaking news here. Five people have been arrested after the remains of a baby have been found at a home in Wigan. Greater Manchester Police have reportedly been on the scene for a number of days. It's understood officers first responded to reports of a concern for welfare. There is not believed to be any risk to the wider public, and we'll bring you more on talk as we get it. Uh, Thomas in Lincoln. Hello, Thomas. Good afternoon, Boris. You well? I'm very well. Good to hear from you. What would you like to say? Well, if Angela Ryan is going to be the deputy leader of the country, she must answer questions. She can't swerve them. 
because she's not on the other side of the benches anymore. She must be accountable for anything that comes across her. The defence we hear from Labour is um, David Lammy, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, put up the view that we are held to a different standard because we're in opposition and this is a private matter was effectively what he was trying to say. That Does that cut any ice with you at all? Well, no, they're, they're, just, they're just pulling out the sheets now to what to say to the media and other people. They know what they're doing. They've been doing it for years, but, you know... Doing what for years? Sorry. Sorry? What have they been doing for years? Sorry, I don't lying. understand. Lying and doing dodgy deals and stuff like that. Now, not all of them, not all of them. Just a lot of them are decent. We get a lot of bad apples in there. It makes it worse for everybody else. Is I, I mean, let me ask you this. We're going down a different road. How you, You've got two former MPs here. Uh, OK, how widespread do you think that sort of corruption of feathering your own nest is in Parliament. There's 650 MPs. Make it easy. Would you put a number on it? I mean, when it came up to the, uh, the, the thing we had a few years ago about the Duck House and... Oh, the expenses in 2010, yes. Yeah. Or 9, 10. Quite a, lot, quite a lot of them got pulled out. Pulled they did. That, or that because of that. Because it was rife. And do you think that's where this perception is that everyone's in it for themselves because of what were some pretty outrageous claims there? I mean, there's so much a duck house, some for Mars bars. I mean, you yes. know, it, but it's like, you, you, you know, if you, can have, if you can have a little figure every now and then, but when it gets big time, you've got to start thinking to yourself, how many more people are at it? Well, the thing I would say there is, such was the outrage the system both of expenses and so forth was was changed rightly so in parliament so I, I don't think we're ever going to see that again you may see the odd idiot trying to do it and so forth but but they generally end up in trouble i guess what i'm going to is how many people do you think are like do you think lots of mps are tax dodging i think i think a few of them are doing it if they know i mean the ones that we don't know about that well, yeah. These are the ones that we know about, but yeah. there's the ones that we don't know about. Like, 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 all but in your them. mind, if I said to you out of 650, Thomas, how many do you think are fiddling their taxes? Uh, what, both sides? Or well, yeah, right across the house, there's 650 MPs. I think about between 30 and 50. Uh, Thomas, thank you for that. I'm going to put that to um, put that to Alistair for his comments. Thomas in Lincoln, thank you very much for that, and we'll take more of your calls, 0344 499 1000. Does the An How much does the Angela affair allegations matter to you? It's an uphill struggle, isn't it? I don't know if you think there's 30 or 50 fiddling their expenses. I think it's impossible to calculate anything like that. I, I, I just give you one, one small story. Uh, I was first elected in 1983. Uh, I was very fortunate on the back of Mrs Thatcher's success, Berry North, uh, a newly created marginal constituency. I took on the sitting MP who was a very, very good Labour MP called Frank White became a great friend. He'd been my MP for a number of years and, and I beat him. Uh, and I beat him only because of the swing on individual performance and characteristics. I was 28 years old, untried and untested. He was uh, late 30s, uh, government whip, great man. One of the first things he said to me when we handed over our cases, which of course you can't do these mm -hmm. days because of data control, but when we met and he handed over the files, he said, have you got an accountant? And I said, no. He said, get one. He said, it's the best thing you can do because that will keep you clear. Uh, it will stop you getting into a mess uh, and it will make sure you've always got a defence if anybody's chasing you. That was 1983. It was good advice and I took it. David Cameron said things like lobbying will become the next big, um, a next big scandal. Mm. I, are we ever going to be able to dispense with the, the complete and utter distrust that is so high? I was up in Hartlepool for one programme. I'm going to Uxbridge on Tuesday for another. Trust comes up. We can't trust them. We can't trust them. We can't but we're trust not a, them. But we're not alone in that, Nick, I think, because, because a number of different institutions, the police, the church, uh, other areas have come under criticism and questioning. The post office, Royal Mail, for God's sake, things that people thought, well, if you work for this institution, well, the institution has such structures, it's bound to be OK. Well, that's all gone. Mm. And people are entitled now, because of all the evidence before them, not to accept things at face value just because somebody but in authority we, says so. I, I, I get in trouble for this because I keep saying to people, 
our parliamentary system, I think, is one of the best in the world. The idea yes, that I could so. be the MP wandering down the street, someone clobbers me and says, Oi, Nick, I've got this issue. And yes. two weeks later, I could be questioning a minister like you and yes. saying, Oi, I got stopped by Joe Bloggs in the street. I mean, it's phenomenal in many ways. But has this last parliament been worse than most for bringing parliament into disrepute? Um. I think this last parliament has been immensely challenging for all sorts of reasons. I think, firstly, the fact that it came, you know, it, it comes at the end of a lengthy period of rule by, by the Conservative Party was bound to make it more challenging. All the problems hadn't gone away. Then there was the pandemic. Then there was the issues of governance. Now, we're not here to talk about the governments of Boris Johnson mm. or Liz Truss, but the impact of elements of governance while they were they were in charge left the public feeling what on earth is going on here so that's been very difficult um and 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 trying to deal with some of the immense problems that a Labour government will inherit and won't be able to fix straight away. First time they come into power without a growing economy. Yeah, it's going to be but, interesting. But has this has this Parliament left a mark on people? Yes, I think it has, and I think it will take some time to overcome that. I came back into into Parliament deliberately in two thousand and one, knowing I was going into opposition, because I think opposition has a point. And I'm sorry if some colleagues are leaving because they don't fancy mm. opposition. Mm. Uh, I did uh, fourteen years. Uh, uh, as a member of the, of the governing party, and I did five years as a minister in that period. Then I came back, I did nine years in opposition before I got the chance of ministry again. And that period of opposition is important for a political party. You do I, learn things uh, that Alistair, way. I bitterly regret not winning in 2005 when I could have had five years in opposition before going onto the government benches. Not least because you could shape policy. I mean, it's a brilliant place to be as you develop the ideas oh, yes. and, and so forth. Anyway, we're going to come back to John uh, after the break, and I'm going to give you a chance again just to finish off our conversation around the Middle East. In the meantime, uh, let me ask you this. Listening to Alistair, uh, if you are minded not to support the Kurt Conservatives, has anything he said maybe given you pause for thought, some of the difficulties that the Conservatives have faced? Uh, or are you absolutely determined to rail hail and storm and thunder down on the Conservatives? and see that they are ousted from power in a general election. 03444 991000. Plus, let me know your thoughts on Angela Rayner. How much does the Angela Rayner affair matter to you? Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, 
They put them in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back. Um, Shirley says, totally agree with Alistair. No one really cares about Raina. She has said she will step down if found guilty. End of story. Much more importantly, where, while she is the main headlines for the media like yourselves, oh, I'm in trouble, obviously, to most people it's getting very boring and so repetitive. None of the media mentions illegal boats still arriving every single day. Shirley, you couldn't be more wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm reading this out, but that is just tosh okay and in fact i'm talking about rwanda later uh, cost of living heating costs potholes etc i've had the king of potholes on this station come on shirley you started well there but that was absolute rubbish at the end so come back give me a call 0344 499 1000 we can disagree but we can disagree respectfully um let's quickly take a call from john before i go to my uh, next question for you alistair john in dorset thank you for calling john what would you like to talk about uh, yes just briefly nick if you remember back in durham um, Beer the gate. police yes. investigated, they sent a questionnaire to Starmer and uh, Rayner, who wasn't there and then she was. It took them 18 days for his legal team, I'm quoting from the report published in the Labour press, or the left-wing press, and it took them 18 days yes. for his legal team to consider a questionnaire. Now, if he's got those kind of legal resources, and one would imagine having been a former... Well, he was our chief prosecutor. <laughs> why didn't they avail this? Why didn't they avail Rayner of this? They obviously have legal people who look at these well, things. Uh, you see, John, I think you make a really good point because Keir Starmer has deliberately, in my opinion, avoided reading the letter and advice she was given. Now, I do find it a little odd that as the most senior prosecutor in the country, he's not able to actually establish quite quickly what went on here. Now, truthfully, HMRC matters are not investigated by the police. It's an HMRC job. But um, 18 days to answer a questionnaire? I guess you're a bit puzzled why a DPP can't do that, aren't you? Well, especially when he quoted his legal team were looking at it. Mm, mm. So uh, We have a whole new lexicon. You see, David Lam Lammy, who's never had an original thought in his life, came up with a... They lived in a blended marriage. Now, I've heard all kinds of describe, <laughs> description of relationships. I've never heard of a blended one. Yes, no, I haven't, actually. So anyone who knows what that is, do call 0344 499 1000. Seriously, to one point, how important is this to you, though, John? It's not, I don't know if it would influence your voting, but, you know, how important, where on the scheme of things in priorities does this sit? Well, I, I suppose it depends where you're sitting. Having listened to her rant and rant and rant about Boris yep. and a piece of cake, yep. oh, yes, it was a criminal investigation, but it was over cake. And there's no real evidence that he actually set it up himself. But she got into this of her own volition. Mm. Well, she certainly she hasn't made it easy for herself. herself. It's, it's the it's double... It's not about cake. It's about whether she cheated the election rules, you know, whether she... The, the money is irrelevant. She's on 84000 a year, plus whatever she gets for her um, position as deputy. So it's small potatoes. The money is irrelevant. It's, it's more the principle, that, isn't it? You know, I mean, she's she's led the charge for years mm. and now suddenly having found wanting, well, it doesn't really apply because we're in opposition. So you can do what you like. You can lie, disseminate, obfuscate, as long as you're in opposition. Well, that what could be one conclusion, three. John. That could be one conclusion people have drawn. John in Dorset, thank you very much for that. I'm only um, making the calls a bit shorter in this first hour because I'm, I'm very pleased to say we've got um, uh, 
<laughs> I just had a complete back, Alistair Burt. I was about to call you something completely different there. Lots of people. <laughs> Who's a former Foreign Office Minister uh, and longtime Conservative and former Deputy Chief Whip. Now, I've got a tweet for you, a message here I, from Barry. Why is conflict in the Middle East always up to the West to resolve or become involved? And he goes on to say, we've spent billions on hardware, etc., etc. Can't the region sort out their own problems, says Barry? It's a very good question, Barry. And I think the answer is history, uh, for one. Uh, Western interests have always been involved in the Middle East. Uh, the United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, we've had territorial control over a number of states in the Middle East until the 20th century. And But the other thing I would say is things are changing. The Middle East is changing. And regional powers are now very clear that they must have responsibility for what is happening in their region. They can no longer expect the United States to dominate everything. The United States is no longer uh, is, is simply the, the only power in the region. Um, efforts made by the West to resolve issues in the Middle East have not been successful, judging by what's happening in, uh, uh, in Israel and Gaza at present. We haven't resolved things. So regional states, uh, who are now very wealthy over the last 50 or 60 years and developing in many different ways, Saudi Arabia, the UAE principally, Bahrain, Kuwait, um, but principally the UAE and Saudi Arabia, very interested in the region around them. Traditionally strong states like uh, Egypt and, and Jordan want also to help shape the region. And I think it's good news for the West uh, and the rest of the world. It's very important the region takes responsibility itself because only they can actually resolve the core issues at the heart of it, which is Iran's relationship with its neighbours and ultimately the question of, of how Israel settles issues well, it's, with the Palestinians and make sure there is security and justice for both Israel and the Palestinian people. And and actually a lot has to revolve around Israel's relationship where there, because in many ways they are supported by so many significant Western allies like the United Kingdom, America and so forth. As long as there is constant threat, which one would say is what Iran is to them, it seems without agreements in place that you can ever reduce Western involvement because of those alliances, surely. But again, those those threats and relationships are, are changing. It was significant that in the last 18 months, Saudi Arabia and Iran began talking again after many years of isolation, the UAE and Iran talking, because neither wants to be in a, none of them want to be in a situation where there is a conflagration and an outbreak of war. So if the United States cannot mend its relationship with Iran, and Israel cannot mend its relationship with Iran, then other states can. And by doing that, remember at the same time, the Gulf states were also talking to Israel, mm -hmm. the creating Abraham's the, Accords, the Abraham yeah, Accords. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, one of the elements of tragedy of October the 7th and the atrocious attacks by Hamas was that a new Middle East that was beginning to emerge has effectively been stopped in its tracks by what's happening. But I think an awful lot of people want to get back to the place for Israel in the region, absent of threat, um, a, a resolution issue uh, involving the Palestinian, Palestinians, because one of the errors of the Abraham Accords was the Palestinian issue was marginalised in the hope it would somehow go away. It won't and it shouldn't. But if that is resolved, then the, it, Iran uses the Palestinian issue to justify some of its positions. It has a relationship with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Nothing will be sorted in the Middle East unless Israel and the Palestinian issue is sorted. But the regional powers, Barry, do want to play a larger part in that, and we should be encouraging that and supporting that. Here, here to that. Now, uh, politically, uh, sort of international and domestic, you've got reform snapping, well, chewing at the heels of the Conservative Party, hemorrhaging support to them if the polls are to be believed. This Monday, ping pong again in the House of Lords and House of Commons as Rishi Sunak tries to get his Rwanda bill and the flights off the ground. So let me link the two questions. First of all, do you think that the Lords will concede to the government will and their Rwanda bill will become law uh, this week, presumably? And secondly, if so, do you think flights will get off the ground and will that make any difference to the hemorrhaging of support to reform, who, of course, one of their key manifesto policies is, I'm not quite sure how, but they will stop the votes. 
Uh, short answer to two questions. Um, will the House of Lords concede this week? Yes, I think so. I was reading some of the reports this week saying a number of peers who had voted against, a number of Conservative peers mm. who voted against, saying sooner or later the, the will of the elected Parliament must prevail yeah, yeah. and is probably reaching that stage now. And I think that is a correct interpretation. Will flights take off? I don't think anyone knows because legal challenges are still uh, still likely. Uh, will it make any difference at the end of the day? No, um, because the number of people involved in any of the flights will be relatively small. I don't think it's sufficient to swing opinions solely on the relation uh, on the issue of migration, both illegal and legal. Uh, and will it affect reform? Well, that's a matter for reform. Um, my own view is you never actually satisfy the right crocodile. It always wants more. It wanted more after but that, Brexit. Are you and saying it wants those voters now. who've left Conservatives to Rwanda are, uh, to, to support reform are crocodiles? They're not really, no, no, are no. they? They're I, fed up. No, no, I'm not saying that. Uh, what I was referring to is the old adage: you can never, you can never feed a crocodile. And that was apparent in the run-up to the Brexit uh, referendum and the Conservative Party uh, was giving in to those who wanted the referendum, saying it'll be sorted, and then after the Brexit vote, it, there was never a Brexit that satisfied some elements of the right, either in the country or in the Conservative Party. That's why Mrs May couldn't get her, uh, her, um, her measures through. That is why Boris unseated her and did what he did. The writer never satisfied, um, and I was referring to that rather than individual voters. They must vote for what they think they want and what they think the country wants. I'm not sure that a drift to the right is in the country's interest, well, that's, but that's their choice. Well, the, the, the country may choose to do that. If 20% yeah. of voters vote for uh, reform, they probably, on 20%, will struggle. They'll get close, but struggle to get an MP, and that's a completely that separate is right. issue. That, they, that's, they will take away votes yeah, from the Conservative uh, Party and reduce further and, the number and they of will. Conservative MPs. But for the Conservatives, let's. I'm going to take a notional figure here, and uh, rather than we argue about it, but let us say they get reduced to 100 50, 160 MPs, pretty much what happened in 97. Yeah. Some will say more, some will say less. Historically, whether it's Labour or the Conservatives, the parties drift right to the left, a la Jeremy Corbyn, or off to the right, as the Conservatives did. Even then, with William Hague, it was a drift to the right, many yes. people saw. And they didn't um, win. And they didn't win. It's going to happen again, though, isn't it? Yes. The, I, I, I've lived my life in the political system and, uh, and in this country, I remember being told very early as a candidate in Berry, uh, dear Berry, that um, Berry won't elect someone hard right or hard left. People in Berry don't do it. It's a very classic demographic. That is why it's the most marginal seat in the country. There is a tendency towards the middle. Now, the middle has got to deliver. There is no point in voting for moderate candidates who don't get anything done. And I think part of the argument now with some voters who want to switch, and they're more than entitled to make, it, make their own judgments, they're not seeing things being delivered. And I've always been in a position of talking to, to you know, moderates of, of a moderate point of view, want to do things in a consensual manner. We've got to succeed. If we don't, people will look for an alternative, and they're entitled to do so. If we don't have answers to people's questions, they'll turn somewhere else. So that's the challenge for us, not to blame people for the way in which they want to yeah. vote. That's or up to never, them. It never win no, works, never win. It? But what are we doing to make a difference? And that's the challenge for Rishi Sunak, and I suspect it'll be the challenge for Keir Starmer not as well, win, though, how they? he meets expectations. The, the Conservatives aren't going to win. I think it's very unlikely, yes. Yeah. Very quickly, Paul, um, I've, I've only got a minute or two, so far away. Hello, Paul. Ah, oh, good afternoon. This Angela Arena, if she's found out, and it, and it is a big if, it's not just a case of her stepping down. She, either, she goes to jail, or she gets fined, or community service, or gets fined and community service. OK, not Paul. Not just stepping down, she has to be punished. You can't like go you to jail wrong, for this offence, I don't think. Or we have to get fined. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, I don't just for side, I don't think you can go to jail for this level of offence. But okay, okay, why okay, does it matter so much? Service. Why does it matter? Yes, yeah, probably that's why I don't know. Why does it matter so much to you? Because you if sound... you and I commit a, if you and I commit a crime, we go to court or we either go to jail or get fined or get fined to community service, mm. she'll just step down like a Freemason, get away with it, scot free. And she'll probably and end up Did you feel this way about uh, law uh, lawbreakers in number ten as well? Everybody, you, I, every single person, everybody, the king, the queen, everybody. 
OK, Paul, I think your passion on that subject is the, probably going to spark more calls. The, the old adage is none of us are above the law exactly. and that has to be demonstrated. And it feels like one democracy. rule for one, doesn't it? And, and one rule for others. That's, it, that's the key, If it does, it? then that has got, that feeling has got to be dealt with. OK, listen, Alistair Burke, the hour has flown by. Thank you to Paul in London. Thank you to you for joining me, Alistair Burke. Thank you for asking, Minister Nick. Really good to have you and I hope we can have you back again and particularly get you on the line when we're talking about the Middle East as well, which uh, I think is one of those huge issues I'm going afraid to dominate we'll be talking us for about a while. it for a while. Yeah. Sad, sadly, I'm afraid we are coming up at two o'clock. We shall be exploring, um, from a uh, from a Labour point of view, the damaging issues facing uh, the, uh, the the party as a result of Angela Rayner. Scarlett Maguire will be joining me, and we'll be having a discussion about that. And of course. Keep the conversation going by joining me, 0344 499 1000. Why does it matter? You heard from Paul. Why does it matter so much to you, uh, the allegations uh, to, to Angela Rayner? Because it clearly does. I was asking, does it? But it seems like for most of you, it's quite clearly a significant issue. So let's explore it further with me here, Nick Dubois, on Talk TV. And of course, you can join the conversation on 0344 Four double nine one thousand, or tweet me at Talk TV or at Nick Dubois. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unbiased and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for, minutes, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hello and welcome back. Uh, thanks to Alistair Burt for joining me there, former uh, Conservative Minister of State in the Foreign Office. Nick, in response to your response to Shirley, this was where she said, no, Angela Rayner is not important to me. I'm asking you that question. Uh, how important is the Angela Rayner affair to you? Uh, and thank you for sharing your views. Keep them coming, 0344 499 1000. But uh, she said, you're not talking about other things. Um, and uh, this, uh, this person, Steve, he said to me, you're in government, I'm not in government. I'm really not. I'm, I'm not like Jake Berry, right? I am not an MP. I used to be. It's like nine years ago now. And you're good at talking about the boats, etc., but you've not done anything about it. That is a fair charge to the Conservative Party, but not to me. I've been a Tory voter since 1987 when I first gained the vote. No more whilst the party is dominated by the left-leaning wets who infiltrated the party under Cameron. If you do not return to true centre-right, a la Mrs T, I'll never vote Tory again. Steve, I'm kind of no issue with you on that, but just to clear that up, if anyone thinks I'm a Conservative MP, I'm not. I was for five years. I'm very proud of that, but I'm not going to take the flack for what's been going on for the last five years. I'm dishing it out, if anything. Uh, if only the parliamentary Conservatives were all measured, thoughtful people like you and Alistair, I would vote for them. However, they're not. Reform is not far right, simply proper Conservatives. If Alistair said far right and I missed it, I would have picked him up on that. So my apologies if I missed that, uh, because I don't buy that uh, as well. Uh, Nick, uh, you may not have agreed with Shirley, Nick, describing her viewpoint as tosh, but there is no need to be rude about it. Um, and uh, it's not on, says Barry. I, I, look, tosh is, I don't think, particularly offensive. Uh, I think the claim that we do not talk about the boats in this media here at Talk TV. It is tosh. I'm sorry. It's it's. There's a nice word. It's. Uh, I don't have particular, and I apologise if anyone is offended by it. But it is tosh. I mean, if anyone else messages me and says we don't talk enough about the boats, I will. Well, I don't have a chocolate hat to eat. But you get my point, don't you? So Barry, I think I think you're wrong on that one. If you don't mind me saying so, I pride us on this show. That I can't. Very rarely do we fall out, but we are all entitled to our opinions. Now, lots of you have been calling in and continue to call in about this Angela Rayner affair. And I'm asking you very simply uh, in, in, in this is how much does this matter to you, particularly in the scheme of things? And it does matter to an awful lot of you. And I, I have a lot of sympathy with your views. So um, I'm very pleased to say we've got a former spokesperson for Labour chair, James Mathewson, who is joining me now to discuss this. Um, James, welcome. Hello, Nick. How are you doing? Very well indeed. Just briefly for everyone's benefit, Labour Chair, do you want to just tell us what it is so everyone knows what you were yeah. chair of? Yeah, absolutely. So I was the spokesperson of the chair of the Labour Party. The chair of the Labour Party, lots of people will remember Tom Watson from yep. his time as the chair of the Labour Party. I was uh, working with the chair under Jeremy Corbyn, who was a guy called Ian Labury. So I worked in that senior leadership team of the Labour Party. And uh, yeah, that was under Jeremy Corbyn's time. So Brilliant. Angela Ray was obviously a feature of that. OK, uh, I'm, I'm glad I clarified it because I, for a minute, the way it's been put on my screen, it looked like a publication. So now I know I've got a very senior expert on the Labour Party here. Look, um, I've been asking people how important it is to them. They have come back. I mean, one or two are saying, no, it's not, OK, in the scheme of things. An awful lot of people are saying, hang on, it's important for the following reasons. Because this lady could be Deputy Prime Minister, and if she's not been straight with us about her taxes and she's been playing around with the electoral role, we should know that. Secondly, others are saying there's a huge whiff of hypocrisy here because, on the one hand, she's calling people out. She called Nadeem Sahawi out and said, publish your tax affairs, and yet... She won't help clear things up by publish, not publishing her own tax advice on this particular issue. Lots of reasons why it's coming in. Um, what's your view of the, the, the rights and wrongs of the, the, the charges and attacks on Angela Rayner? Yeah, so I think it's very interesting. Um, I think the position Angela's taken to 
you know, kind of say, well, look, I'll, I will publish, if you publish, is uh, putting the Tories in a bit of a difficult position, as is the situation with her now basically saying that she will not, uh, or she will she will obviously uh, go along with all the, the investigations, the police investigations, show them everything she needs to, but that she said she will resign, which is similar to obviously what Kia Starmer said uh, during that allegation, you know, of the whole be a gate scenario as well. Um, and that paid off for him in the long run. And knowing Angela and having worked with Angela, um, I am a, a huge fan of her. You know, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to disclose the fact that I think she's fantastic. She's a brilliant individual. Um, I have no idea what's actually happened in the, in the reality with this situation, but I do know how to be a truthful and honourable person. I do think there is, when we talk about hypocrisy, there is a huge whiff of hypocrisy here from the Tories. We talk about, you know, all of a sudden we're bothered about tax affairs for the for the sum of £3,000. She said if she is found to have broken the law, she will resign. That's what we should expect from people. Um, and it's what we've not seen from Tories in recent years, especially under Boris. Well, we have seen them resign, but maybe they were dragged to it and kicking dragged and screaming. Dragged to it, exactly. But okay, somebody but... actually taking the stance that they will hold themselves okay. to a high Well, yes, but there will be some people who will say she's doing that to put extra pressure on the police. A lot of people thought Keir Starmer was very clever doing this because there was no way the police wanted to, investigating him over Beergate, would want to topple the leader of the opposition. But let me go back to your first point, which I think is interesting. Where you said her response was, I think, effectively pretty good when she said, I'll show you my tax fares if you show me yours. Mm. And yet, in respect of the Nadim Sahawe case, where we were talking a lot more money, granted, a lot, lot more money, she said this, um, his story about his tax affairs doesn't add up. Well, some would say currently that's true of, of Andela Rayner. They don't know, but that's what they're saying. And she goes on to say, um, every pound of tax that is not delivered to the Chancellor and to the Exchequer means that it damages our public services, she said, and then called on him to publish his tax returns. She didn't say, oh, here's mine, by the way, Nadim Sahari, now publish yours. It's not quite yeah. the same. It's not quite the same. No, you're right. I, but I do think um, there is a, a disparity here between Angela's situation and the likes of Nadim Zahawi. And it's not just the amount of money. It's the uh, level in which you are versed in this kind of thing. Nadim Zahawi, you know, I mean, the, the, the money we're talking about, I mean, this is a man who used public funds to heat his stables that his horses were in. You know, Angela's situation is one that I could very well find myself in at some point because I don't understand tax affairs of owning a home because I've never lived in an owned home. I've always lived in, you know, I grew up in um, in council housing. I've never owned a house. I don't own a house now. And if I was to own a house because of, you know, the wonderful social mobility we find ourselves capable of in this country. Um, Mainly down be... to Margaret Thatcher allowing you to buy your council house, which, of course, <laughs> well, Angela Rayner did. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's you know that there is that situation, of course, but at the same time, I didn't understand. I don't understand the this point. kind of thing. Okay, I've worked in politics, and my you know I wouldn't have parents that I can go to to ask Angela's in the same situation as well. So there's a disparity there. Okay, listen, I th I've got a lot. I've got a lot. This is my theory, right? Because I put out on Twitter today something else which which didn't draw as much attention as the criticism, but I actually um, I got a lot of time for Angela Rayner. I think she breaks the mold in terms of type of people we have in politics. I think she relates to an audience that many politicians don't, aren't able to relate to. I think she's done an awful lot of things I don't like, by the way, from some of the language she, she's used to, to her policies. But I totally think she is a really quite a force in politics and in Labour Party politics. You could almost say I was talking about Boris Johnson in a similar vein, but, but she cuts through where places other people don't. I have a distinct feeling here that she screwed up, that she just literally screwed up and got it wrong. And therefore, isn't her mistake here to try and come up with a lengthy, lengthy obfuscation, a lengthy cover-up, Shambhushay, rather than just come out and say, you know me, it's Angela, I screwed up here, I didn't get it, and I'm paying this cheque. She would have got flack for about a day and it would all be over. 
Yeah, I mean, that's it. And I mean, whether Angela knows now whether she did screw up or not, that's still the question, you know. And these things are such because when it comes to the matter of the legal issues, and especially when it comes into with the police being involved, you know, what does cross the line and what is, you know, what is illegal, what isn't, you know, putting it in the hands of those people and saying, look, I will fully uh, cooperate with you and I will resign if I'm found to have, have, you know, broken the law, rightly so. And I will, you know, be able to share everything I can with everybody. He has been very clever in the sense that he hasn't looked Well, at he's anything. kept his hands right uh, off. If yeah. I was Angela Rayner, I'd watch out for that political knife in the political back. Um, oh, it's always going to it's always going to be there from a leader to a deputy. I mean, you know, he has to protect himself. He has to protect the leadership of the party. She knows that because she's faced that situation with him before. So, and, she and she won. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, and she won. Yeah. But again, I come back to this. What was interesting about Angela Rayner was she was different. She was cut from a different cloth. And you, I kind of explained why I welcomed that. Here, she's relegated herself to pretty much every other MP who gets in trouble, being forced, kicking and screaming, to a situation where she finally has to say, um, OK, there's nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Um, she's had the Shadow Foreign Secretary out defending her. She's had Keir Starmer sort of defending her. But she's been dragged kicking and screaming to a position where she has to issue a statement and say, I'm really pleased there's an investigation on. It's going to help clear things up. And guess what? You know, I'm, I'm so pleased I tried to avoid all of this and told you there was nothing to see. That's where I'm disappointed, if you like. She's just another politician. I don't think she is. I really don't think she is. And I think this actually shows more that she isn't because these things, these affairs, these things that many people, middle class people take for granted as understanding, as having had the complications of owning a home and going through all those details. Oh, to me, yeah, it come, come, on, like come on, James. After day more, two, yeah. day two, someone would have said, you've cocked up here, Angela. I would have. Lo I think Angela Rayner could have got away with just coming out and saying, I screwed up here. I really do. And that's what I think is her, her mistake. She's not that different, I guess, is what I'm saying to you, to other I think politicians. That, I think the, the place that it's come from, though, you know, whether they're coming from the mail, whether it coming from the right wing press, that, you know, there will be a defensive element of rightly so. There will be an element of, hang on a minute, I'm not getting taken down by these people. Who do they think they are? These are the people who defend non-doms. These are the people who defend tax avoiders of, of, of colossals of millions of pounds. You know, I am not getting taken down by these people. That will be part of a, a, a sense. And in, in a way, she's right, I think, on that. Because when it comes to the fact that the male are running this and they're trying to attack Angela Rayner, there's one reason for it. And it's because of the asset, as he rightly pointed out, the asset that Angela Rayner is to the Labour Party, to the next Labour government, and crucially, we will see Angela shine and come into her own at an election because she really can cut through in communities where Keir Starmer can't even cut through. So I think... Uh, they, well, they, James, just on a serious point... Well, the whole, the whole thing's serious, but on a different but serious point, one last question to you. Um, kind of during the Blair-Prescott relationship... It was Blair and Brown who were front and centre of the election campaign. And you got the feeling they sent Prescott, Prescott to parts of the country where they thought he'd be OK, but they kind of didn't really want him in the limelight because he might do something daft and then he goes and punches someone or something from memory. All, all, all history. I, I'm not convinced Angela Rayner this will help because I have a feeling this is going to put Angela Rayner in the shadows and it's going to be very much Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves show this election, isn't it? Yeah, I, I haven't spoken with people who are around Lotto at the moment. There is an understanding, and I'm very reassured by that understanding, that Angela can communicate where Rachel Reeves and Kia Starmer cannot. And I think as That's long an awful as... lot of the country, then. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just about the North. I mean, you take people like me, you know how reassuring it is to hear somebody with an accent. An accent, that's all we're talking about. What's wrong about. with my accent? You're not going to get prejudicial on accents with me, James Matthewson. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, got a thank you. Accent, Nick. <laughs> thank you very good for uh, thank you for a very good and a reasonable discussion around that. I do appreciate it. That's James Matthewson, former spokesperson for Labour Chair, which is a, a senior a party political post in the Labour Party. How much does the Angela Rayner story matter to you. 0344 4 double nine one thousand. Uh, Joe in Bournemouth. Joe, thank you very much for joining us. What would you Hello. like to say? Oh, it, it absolutely winds me up, this Angela Rayner thing. 
and the fact that Labour and everyone's trying to accuse everyone else of doing bad around her just to try and make her look better. And now, that is interesting, isn't it? It's like the what about argument, isn't it? Yeah. It's, and I mean, the thing that really, really, really annoys me at this is there's millions of people in this country like myself that don't get any handouts from the council, the government. We work really hard. We pay into the pot. We do our tax affairs correctly. We know how to do it properly. You know, we know when you want to stretch it. Now, she is meant to be the deputy leader. OK, and she could be deputy leader of the country. And if you think she's stupid enough not to realise what she was doing when she was trying to pretend she's living at one property and not the other, then you're all mad. She knew what she That's was doing. That's a fair point to now... make, Joe. It's a fair, uh, it, it is a fair point to make. Uh, I, I, um, I kind of think I'll... I, I respect that view, and I think you're probably more right than me. There is part of me thinks that this was... Dis Remember, this was done quite a while ago before yeah. she was an MP. I think she just cocked up and she's got into political cover-up. Your point as well being that where you say she should have turned around and said, you know, at the time, hands up, made an error... 100% correct and mm. that's where she's totally lost with me now the one other thing that you're going to look at here is any normal person in this country if they had done that and they get caught it's fraud now fraud you can't work in a bank you can't work in financial services there's so many jobs you can't get she you could can't be a secretary of state you can't get a loan she, you know and she couldn't be how could she be if she's done this and she's she's done with fraud that's why she's saying she'll give her job in because she wouldn't be able to well uh, actually all she said is she'd step down from being shadow uh set, which is a non-paid job shadow deputy leader well not shadow deputy leader deputy leader of the labor party and shadow secretary of state for housing and local government she's not even saying i'll resign as an mp so i don't think she's putting that much on the line if i'm brutally no. honest joe i'm uh, just a thought for you one of the defences that we constantly get is, oh, Angela Rayner, it's nothing like Nadim Sahawi. He had tax issues of millions of pounds, wrote a large cheque. Why are we getting upset because of the amount? I That winds me up a little bit because I think it's the principle. A hundred percent. And the thing is that a lot more people live in my shoes in this country where we pay a lot into the pot and we don't get much out. Mm. And you see people, when you get the right to buy, that's a privilege. You get discounted rent, that's a privilege. Then you get the right to buy, you make money on that. And then to go and just try and squeeze that little bit extra out, that is what I think really takes a mick when it comes to this. Especially when you're on 95 grand a year. Hey, listen, now, um, yeah. thank you, Joe. Thank you very much indeed for that call. Lots of calls coming in on this, and I'm, I'm not surprised, but I think we're asking um, a really interesting question here because it's understanding why people are cross or not cross. Now, only two or three people have said this doesn't particularly wind them up. If you're one of those, I would also love to hear with you and have a chat. I think it's a perfectly credible position to take. I'm just curious to find out more. So yeah, why, if you like, um, or how does the Angela Rayner uh, scandal um, affect you? How much does it matter to you? Uh, in that sense. And also, if it doesn't matter to you, share that with me. I'd be really interested to have your views. Uh, lots of messages coming in as well as calls. I'll get to those later. Meanwhile, let's keep the conversation running. You can call me or WhatsApp me. Send me a voice message. I love those. Please, someone send me a voice message. 0344 499 1000 and call on that same number. 0344 499 Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
they might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Andrew in High Peak sent me a message. What about the hypocrisy of Angela Rayner selling her council house, the one she bought under the uh, Thatcher bike to right, uh, right to buy, uh, making 48,000 profit, yet clearly opposing the policy, the right to buy, and also saying they put a stop to it. That is so socialist, isn't it? Like, uh, we're going to send our kids to uh, private school, but we're going to stop you doing it. And this is pretty much the same point uh, this chap Andrew in Hyde Peak is saying. That's total hypocrisy that no one mentions. Well, you did, Andrew, and I'm, I did actually mention it in my interview there just with James Mathewson, actually, when he said, isn't it great social mobility? You can get your own house. And I pointed out it's down to Margaret Thatcher. Also, her general attitude, Andrew goes on, I won't read all 5,000 words of his essay, legitimising rhetoric using the phrase Tory scum. True. My rant is over. Alistair Burt was very good. Thank you very much. More of those are coming in, as you can expect. Now, just uh, briefly, uh, I'm, go I'm going to take as many of your calls as you know. In, in the last 20 minutes, we actually try and pack it with calls, but I'll try and uh, get one more in as well uh, before then. But Joe Biden, um, he said, as I was discussing with Alistair Burt, about an imminent attack uh, of Iran on Israeli, uh, well, on Israel, Israeli interests. We've now seen... Uh, and the story is, is, is that the Israeli Revolutionary Guard have seized an Israel-linked ship, whatever that may mean. Uh, Alistair Burt, former Foreign Office Minister, was basically saying, this sounds like what I think, I'm not sure he used this word, but what he's suggesting, this is a proportionate response. Because the threat here is, are we facing huge escalation, escalation in the Mideast? The stock market in America dipped hugely yesterday. Uh, which affects us all, by the way, when, whether you like it or not, whether you have shares invested or not. Uh, and, um, and that is a very worrying and daunting question, and principally because of Angela Rayner. I don't think we've been spending enough time talking about it. I'm about to put that right. Roger Givo, geopolitical expert, and also, I think, finance and business expert, but he's not here in that capacity. Roger, welcome. Thank you, Nick. Good to have you uh, on the show. Thank you for your time. Interesting, my conversation I had with uh, Alistair Burt, who's a very, a very distinguished former uh, sec uh, uh, Minister of State for the Foreign Office. He was saying, uh, look, th this has been building up that there would be some retribution from Iran because of the attack on their interests in Lebanon. As this news was breaking, he said, this sounds like what I think is a, a, a proportionate within the bounds response that reduces the risk of escalation. If indeed that's what this is, you may know more. 
Well, first of all, forgive me if I, if I can just say, you actually said a moment ago the Israeli Revolutionary Guard. Did I? I'm sorry. <laughs> the Iran Revolutionary Guard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. right. That'll go I viral. I, <laughs> I think that Alistair is absolutely right. It is, it is proportionate. Uh, but I don't think it's about uh, Hezbollah uh, uh, launching all the uh, rocketry that they habitually do from Lebanon in this case. This, uh, I believe, as do most uh, geopolitical uh, people, um, is a retaliation for the killing of 13 people, the head of which was General Zahedi, um, because many people believe, uh, especially many Israelis, that he's the bloke that pushed the button uh, to go ahead with 7th October. He's the one that told Hamas, go, go, go. So um, Israel took him out, and Iran now wants uh, its revenge for that. Now, I think there's two facts. I think, I think everything you've said is quite accurate, Nick, and everything Alistair said, of course, is, is very profound and, and, and correct. Um, and there are really two factors uh, here. There's the hawks and the doves in Iran. Um, the first point is that there is no, just absolutely no tactical or strategic, no tactical, no strategic advantage or reason for uh, Iran to attack Israel uh, any more than it does daily through its proxies at this point. Uh, revenge, uh, as they say, is best served cold, and the ovens of the Middle East are flaming like an out-of-control Roger, auger. can I stop you there? And just yeah. I remember the conversations after October the 7th, the Hamas attack uh, on Israel, lots of people were very fearful of an escalation which would bring Iran into the conflict. I don't remember many people sort of saying at the time, well, it's not in Iran's interest to do that. Um, I could be wrong. My memory might be going. Uh, who knows? But but that it does seem to have changed now. We're almost getting a message that Iran is kind of knows how to behave. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. I think there are two schools. I think the hawkish uh, people in Iran, uh, which apparently, I'm told, includes Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, want revenge. Uh, and of course, Israel can absolutely flatten Iran. Um, Israel has precision-guided you know, weaponry that they can't even imagine, whereas Iran just has huge stockpiles of cheap but quite effective very basic weapons that they can throw at Israel. If they escalate this, it could very easily get out of hand. That's why stock markets are reacting. It could turn, as Donald Trump has said, into World War III. Uh, we are really, uh, it, it's its almost close to a, a Cuba Bay of Pigs crisis for people who remember that. Uh, it all depends on what the Iranians do. Now, their first move uh, has been proportionate. Uh, you know, Iran has, has almost never attacked Israel. The only time Iran directly attacked Israel in recent times is in 2018 when they fired rockets uh, on the Golan Heights. Let me ask you, do, this might sound like something out of a novel, but just assume I've been a, a bit dim here. Does, do, do, do back channels go on? Where Absolutely. Iran, well, is, is Iran effectively going to be saying, look, you chaps in Washington, don't overreact to this, but we're just going to... We're going to take over this boat. Is that going to be going okay? On. Well, you write novels, so you know. I mean, but they're go. Yes, they're going on right now. Absolutely, um, they're quite active. Uh, India, all kinds of people are involved in talking, and it's actually burst over the borders of the back channels, and it's becoming louder now. It's actually chatter, where countries are lining up under other countries, all saying to Iran, "For God's sake, do not overreact." You will have Israel, which can destroy you in 30 seconds, and you'll have the United States. You, they, will, they will wake up Joe Biden, you know, and he will come and get you. When he says don't, that's not the most effective threat, but, you know, okay. pay attention to it. Um, one thing uh, Alistair Burt was saying is we had a message come in. I, can't, I think it was from, a, from Barry. He said... Why do we, the West, always get involved in uh, s basically sorting out the Middle East at cost to lives, cost to, to money? And actually, Alistair said, look, I'm quite optimistic that the 
the regional states in the region are stepping up. And actually, you know, we saw that with the Abrahams Accord. We've seen Saudi talking to Iran at one point. He kind of had a sense of, of a measured optimism that the, the region is stepping up because in many ways the West probably won't as much. I mean, is that is that fair? Um, no, I think that uh, I think he's got it slightly backwards, Barry. Uh, first of all, um, Israel has got a lot of allies in the Arab states, but they are not going to attack another Muslim country. So they, they aren't going to join with Israel in anything. Um, um, Iran has only one ally in the Middle East, and that's Syria. And they're so occupied with their own problems that they probably won't be terribly affected. Uh, that's why everybody's talking and everybody's urging Iran to be cautious and measured. But Barry's point about why do we get involved in things in the Middle East? Well, the answer to that, Barry, is very simple. Because the people driving this in Iran and the people driving their proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, Islamic Jihad, and all the rest of them, the people driving the Axis partners, as we now call them, Russia, Iran, China, Yemen, North Korea, these are all people that are influenced by actually 7th century Wahhabi uh, Islamic dictates that infidels do not belong in the world. They should be gotten rid of. If you're not their kind of Muslim, not an ordinary Muslim, if you're not their kind of Muslim, you know, good riddance, goodbye. So the point is, we're next. All of us are next. The reason we're doing this is not because we're fighting a war for somebody else in the Middle East. It's because if these guys grow in power, they'll be on our doorstep next. And actually, you can already see that in London you know, much of the time right now. Uh, Roger, listen, thank you very much for joining us, talking us through what's going on. I'm feeling slightly reassured talking to Roger and Alistair that the escalation that many have been talking about between Israel and Iran, which is a huge leap and, and, and very destabilising, we just don't need more world shocks, uh, may actually be contained. 0344 499 1000 if you feel threatened by the prospect of an escalation in the Middle East or if you feel that actually the West involvement, the time, if you like, our continued involvement in the West may actually be reducing because the regional states are stepping up to the mark to try and work together. Saudi, Iran, the Abrahams Accords before the horrors of the Hamas attack on Israel. Uh, are you fearful or are you optimistic? 0344 nine one thousand. Keep your calls coming on Angela Rayner. I suppose I'm asking is how important and does it matter the scandal uh, that's surrounding Angela Rayner and our domestic politics at the moment? 0344 nine one thousand. Let's talk to Gareth in Derby. Hello, Gareth. Uh, hello, I was about to say good morning, but of course it's good afternoon by a long shot. Well, you may, you may be in another part <laughs> of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, I was recently, but anyway, that's another story. But yeah, no, I've been listening to your conversation about this, and it, it is really interesting, and actually a lot of your uh, callers mm. have made some really good points. Mm. Um, nevertheless, and I think you've also done quite well for standing up for Angela Rayner as well, to at least give a perspective on it. Well, it's um, rather than just pile in, I, I want to dig deeper, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, at least, yeah, because it, there is a democratic issue to this, and I'm I'm slightly uncomfortable and nervous about individual MPs being totally targeted about personal misdemeanours and such like, because, you know, there is actually a narrative behind this in terms of she is a democratically voted MP, isn't she? So she's got a faction of the Labour Party that she's really popular with. And it is ironic that... You know, the Labour Party, they hounded Boris Johnson out of his job, didn't they, really? Because, I mean, they started yes. on his um, personal attacks on him. And there was a certain faction of the Conservative Party that, that turned on him as well yeah. and latched on to that. Yeah. And what we ended up with is losing a prime minister who was actually democratically voted in. Um, you know, I think these things should be left to the ballot box. You see, I I, Gar Gareth, can I just stop you on, on one thing there to... to, to to continue the discussion is absolutely ultimately the ballot box will matter and I'm absolutely certain whatever the outcome of the Angela Rayner issue she's going to be returned with a thumping majority but past, past putting that and that's their verdict they're basically saying fine carry on with your job and that is the ultimate ultimate verdict I think 
The issue I've got, and I thought this was where you were going, is that over this relatively small sum, but that, that, that's important nevertheless, this sort of um, attack, whilst I can see so many reasons why it's justifiable, who's going to go into politics thinking that their tax affairs are going to be scrutinised down to this sort of detail? Well, I, I actually agree with you on that. And of course, I mean, you know, when you think of people paying the tax and people having issues with the tax man, yeah, you wouldn't want to have them scrutinised like that, for sure, because, I mean, people do make mistakes. Yeah. And this is complicated. But, but you know, the, the main thing for me is that I wonder, inside the Labour Party, is there a faction in the Labour Party who might think that it would be good, you could and useful if Angela Rayner doesn't come uh, out uh, listen, on this? I, I couldn't name names, but within every party, there is always yeah. a faction. And whilst a lot yeah. of people are, are going over the top about uh, Nadine Dorry's book, The Plot, you know, I read parts of that and I go, yeah, I can recognise that, I can recognise that. Um, there, there, there are factions, there will be jealousies, there will be all sorts of, uh, all sorts of reasons. And frankly, the relationship, as we were hearing from this chap, Jamie Matheson, one of my guests earlier, former um, uh, spokesman for Labour chair, he's, he's, he's basically saying the relationship between leader and deputy leader is always a fractious one. So there could be people in the leader of the opposition's office quite happy to stoke the flames on this. Yeah, because, I mean, Keir Starmer can't get rid of Angela Rayner if he wanted to, can he? Because, nope. and you know, I think this is a subject for the silly season. I yeah, except it's not the police... silly season. We're right in the middle yeah, of local but, elections. We've got a general yeah, election coming up. I, I don't think that um, I don't think the police will be involved in it. I really don't. I'd be surprised if they are. Well, I think I no, mean, they are. To be fair, they're involved in the investigation into the electoral register because they've yeah. said they're going to. Uh, what I'm totally unclear on is all these people linking the police to her tax affairs. The police do not investigate tax affairs. That's the HMRC. And Look I'm not quite sure what's happening there. No, well, that's it. We will uh, see. Hey, great conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Gareth in, in Derby, um, who, for one minute, I thought he was on a different time zone up there, but that'll just get me into trouble. Uh, let's just read one or two messages first. Uh, hey, Nick, everyone keeps saying this happened long before Angela was an MP. This house sale happened in March 2015 and she became an MP in the same year. I'm livid about it, Linda. Linda, do share with me why you're livid. I think that's what we're digging into. That's not, I'm not being facetious there. I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to find out all the different reasons. Uh, no, I don't care about Angela Rayner. It's right that it's been raised and investigated. I think, though, the Tories are trying to deflect from their poor performance and record and are hardly in a position to criticise. Thank you, says Audrey in North Wales. I think... I don't think two wrongs make a right. I think that they are entitled to criticise. They also obviously take a risk because everyone's also talking about Nadim Sahawi's tax affairs. But I think, I think they are right to do this, just as Angela Rayner says she was right to attack as leader of the uh, opposition. Uh, I think any scrutiny towards politicians is welcome, but after Beergate and the demonstrably corrupt police investigation, my faith in a correct and proper investigation is pretty dismal, says Adam. Thanks for your calls. More of that coming up. But Denya's delights will be with us very soon. 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Before we uh, go to Steve Denyer, uh, I just want to have uh, a conversation and find out the latest on what's going on in Sydney. As you know, six people were killed in a stabbing, quite horrific. I'm very pleased to be joined by Paula Marcellos. She's the Waverley Council Mayor. Now, Waverley is a suburb in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, which of course is in New South Wales, and it's located seven kilometres east of the main business district there. Uh, and um, obviously, uh, we've only heard uh, reports throughout the day of what's going on. I'm very pleased, Paula, that you're able to join us. Can you tell us what's the latest situation is uh, out in Sydney at the moment? First of all, thank you for having me on and for your interest. Uh, we are a community that is in deep shock. Um, as uh, you reported, there were five women and one man who were deceased and a six month old baby who was also stabbed is taken to hospital and there are uh, seven other people in hospital as well. Um, there were some pretty extraordinary acts of heroism, I have to say, by ordinary people who were there just to shop or to meet up with friends. And I think you've probably seen the footage where people are there to um, help other people who were injured or helping people get out of harm's way. And that just shows you the spirit of, of the people who, who live in Waverley and eternally grateful that um, they were, you know, they helped in the way that they did. But more to the point, the heroism of the female police officer who mm. actually on her own um, approached the man, she, she shot him and then applied CPR to him. And I thought, gosh, that's an extraordinary act of she, bravery. Sorry to interrupt you there, Paula. I understand she was there by by chance almost. So I, I, I'm not sure if she was on duty or not. I presume she was because she had uh, her yes. gun with her. Yes, she did, and she was in uniform, and um, and she's actually a senior a senior police officer as well. Uh, so you know, extraordinary bravery, extraordinary heroism. Uh, this afternoon or early tonight, because um, it's almost midnight here in Sydney, um, the police commissioner ha had uh, revealed to us that the offender was a 40 year old man who was actually known to the police. And what's significant about that is that she believes that he doesn't actually have any kind of terrorist ideology, that it was a random act. So that's a relief. Mm. and. 
the fact is that there is now no ongoing threat to the community and he did act alone. So as I said, we're a community that is highly traumatised, but that is at least some comfort. So the main thing now... Sorry, yes? No, no, uh, the, the, thank you for, for, for that. Um, apologies for interrupting. So there's there's definitely no fear of any linked further threat. The threat is, is over as such. Um, well, that's what the police are saying. So yeah. we're just waiting for their investigation to be completed now. And and I I, I mean, it's difficult to imagine what might happen. Uh, you know, as a city in London, we've obviously witnessed, and in Manchester, we've we had, mm. had 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 horrors um, of a of a different type and similar. But uh, to many of us, it feels like Sydney is just not the place where this happens. Um, no. uh, I, 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 and and I don't even know if that's factually accurate. I'm scratching my memory to to remember it. But uh, I always believe it's a very young, a very vibrant city, uh, 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 and so forth. What um, mm. what are what are what are people your your constituents, your rep, people who I know it's late, but what are they saying? What are they feeling? Uh, uh, what, are they already asking questions? Yes, people are, are are very deeply shocked. Quite a few people um, are traumatized. The social media is full of people asking, "What on earth has happened?" Um, I think people are really wanting some answers, but it's very important that the police are allowed to do their investigations. They're actually working very quickly and, and very methodically on this. And uh, I think that as soon as the police are actually able to give some clarity, um, that will give people some resolution and some closure because you're right. I mean, we consider Waverley to be a really safe place to be. We have a lot of tourists. We've got um, a very vibrant community, as you say. Bondi Junction Westfields is also a large shopping centre that draws a lot of people there. It's always very busy. And the fact that this has happened in this way and in this number, certainly um, it's it's not something that people ever would have thought possible. Well you know, people going out for their shop and six people are not coming back. No, I, I'm, I'm the horrors and our sympathies with the family, the relatives and all Thank of those you. who went through the, the drama. Paula uh, Marcelos, Waverley Council Mayor, thank you very much for giving us an update, particularly at this very, very late hour. Uh, that's the latest we have from Sydney, obviously, uh, although I suspect we won't hear very much during the rest of uh, rest of this show. We'll update you and I'm sure we'll be talking more tomorrow as more emerges. In the meantime, Steve Denyer, Virgin Radio presenter, Denyer's Delights. Let's lift the spirits. A Good afternoon, Nick. Um, I've got some fascinating uh, Can you news. stop stalking me? <laughs> we did see each other on the street earlier, didn't we? Me. We had, we had a, first <clears throat> kind of a programming meeting in the middle of the street yeah, by a train, a train we station we did. earlier. We did. I mean, there's no it. end of it. I mean, I'm just surprised you haven't laid a taxi on, so I didn't have to walk. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay. Uh, yes. He's, he's a chef, right? He's a chef. We <laughs> okay. mentioned this earlier with the doctors this morning. The Sun read, read, uh, ran this kind of story of squatters mm. uh, moving into his restaurant, which is right near uh, London's Regent's Park. Now, I've got some more details, and there's lots of twists and turns in this. Now, it's a £13 million London pub they were having rent conversations so they closed his his restaurant bar down so squatters have have moved in these people are called the camden arts cafe and what they're doing is they're using the kitchen equipment to provide food and then deliver it to homeless people in London. Now, apparently the police are desperately trying to evict the squatters. The squatters are saying we, ha we haven't technically broken any laws. Well, how, how did they get in? Because I thought you couldn't... Br I may be wrong, but I thought squatters couldn't break in. But if you can get in without breaking in, that's this when you it. can take it See, over. See, no, we don't know. This is a grey area. So someone's They're... suggesting they were let in? Well, hello. Yeah. Mm. Mass squatters, uh, professional squatters, um, so it was closed in between this kind of grey area where they were sorting out rents because apparently the rent is like £640,000 a year Which just to rent the it, pub even, area. Even at celeb prices, that's probably quite that's hard quite to make hefty, profit. Isn't it? It? it does sound like one of his 
real kitchen nightmares is uh, so we'll keep an eye on this story just uh, interesting enough to update it right. that it is a group who are providing food using his equipment using his kitchen equipment so we didn't know that a couple of hours ago it's so. not going to be a good look if they're forcibly escorted now is it it's going to no. be quite interesting it's, it's, it's mucky do you think, isn't it do you think he might go in there and give them some tips this is it I mean it's a reality TV well, show d- I happen, mean look I, I have no idea about this but let me move away from that conversation so I don't sort of uh, align myself too much with that but yeah. my goodness these chefs they do anything for publicity as i said nothing to do with that i'm not suggesting anything i go home there's master chef on and i'm saying what are you doing watching that it's strangely saying, watchable though, and then people it? sit there watching someone cook something yeah. on tv Half and I'm an going, hour later i find myself even though i haven't and cooked then for you years. read them in the papers and they've left the sixth wife or something or they've yeah. written another book you go into a bookshop i can't find my book anywhere but there's about five million Yes. Things on to cook. And you buy the cookbooks, I've got them, and I've never opened them. I've never attempted once to make any dish from any of the books. Can I just... Yes. Um, it's beautiful weather for most of the UK. It is, it is. And it feels yes. like summer's creeping in. This is the very first weekend of the very first music festival of the it's entire early, yeah. year. Let Big me take you for the UK. to Los Angeles, yeah. uh, just outside Los Angeles in Idaho, the Coachella Music Festival has started. And right now, now Coachella started in 1999, is that uh, the name or it, a thing? It's called Coachella. Okay. I went there in 2015. It's a okay. huge um, festival in the desert, in the desert, uh, just outside of Los Angeles, about two hours outside of Los Angeles. And the idea is every year they have a stellar lineup, but they also have a surprise artist who comes on stage and I can reveal that it was Shakira who went on stage last night and not only went on stage as a surprise, but now she's going on a, on a world tour. Now, Coachella's interesting. It really is another level beauty. If you're watching on TV right now, you'll see some of the sceneries. Um, it's big you know, business festivals. Y- yeah, and the UK does very well out of them. I mean, oh. we do. So obviously we've got Glastonbury yeah. coming yeah. up. We've but got lots of festivals. There's one near me called the Standard Music Festival. Yeah, right? there's so many. I mean, you'll find now, pretty much in a couple of weeks' time, uh, there's one every weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So Virgin Radio, of course I work for them. Yeah. We are at Latitude in July. Chris Evans has got his own festival, um, mm. Car Fest, in August. So they're great things to be part of and... It's just nice to say the season's upon us. Yeah, it is. And, and we're warming up. We're going to it. Can I just ask you a really important question? Go on. Wasn't Shakira in the Jungle Book? <laughs> what was the tiger called? Or the, there was a, there was, <laughs> I'm sure there was. So I wouldn't know how he's got into music. I'm or, far too young to even have that point of reference. Don't you see they're Googling it. They're Googling it. I'm sure it was called Shakira. Someone a, help. Shere Khan, was it? Shere Khan. Uh, maybe, I know t- time's tight. I wonder yes. if we can just talk oh, about Madonna? the movie oh. that everybody's talking Which about. Which one is that? Never have I seen, never ever have I seen so many different opinions. We are talking about the Amy Winehouse movie. Oh, yeah, May yeah, I play yeah. you yes, do. a Go bit on, of the trailer just to give yes. us It'll have to be a bit idea. shorter, I imagine. <laughs> oh, we'll get it one day. Oh, there we go. Uh, oh. Uh. It, it wouldn't be my show if we didn't have a link properly. We uh, haven't got it, have we? Oh. Thing. Me. I want to be a wife. I want to be a mum. In my head. High. Probably run off with someone famous anyway. You're my heartbeat. You're my soul. I love you. In my tears dry. I don't bang out tenets by lunch. I need to live my songs. So that's what I'm going to go and do. Do you want to hear my impression, Nick? Do you want to hear my impression? I ain't no Spice Girl. What do you think of that? I practiced that all morning. That actress, I recognise her. Yeah, she's amazing. She, she is, is really, she's really, really amazing. Um, Marissa Arbella. That's it. She plays Amy. Not only does she play Amy, but she also sings the songs in the style of Amy. So they're really believable. I mean, there's so many different reviews. Can I give you my take yeah, on yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. I went to see it yesterday. I was the only person in the cinema yesterday afternoon maybe to do with the in good my weather. day you used to get arrested like that <laughs> <laughs> wearing a long mac <laughs> um it's it it is glossy yeah and i think the thing is because in this country we remember it's still very fresh in our minds and we remember the daily headlines the unraveling of yeah, amy yeah, winehouse yeah. this is meant for a global market so this is meant for people who maybe bought the album they kind of you know heard that she died but don't really know the story so it's kind of glossy 
and it's Hollywood, and it's a bit like the Bohemian Rhapsody movie yeah. that they did with Queen. It's fast moving. It doesn't shy away though from the bad stuff. I've got to say that clip looked all right to me. I was it's thinking dramatic. I might watch that. All I'd say is that Blake looks a bit like Dermot O'Leary in the movie slash James Dean, and I'm thinking he's far too polished to play that character. But, but most people aren't going to worry about no, that, No, I don't Steve. think so. I learned Most some... of us are still probably thinking, who's Amy Winehouse in my generation? No, that's not true. Well, you see, that's you interesting. See, my generation, I think this is a real... You know, having watched lots of the biopics, the Bob Marley one, the Queen, slightly before Didn't my like Bob time. Marley one. Got well, bored. I wasn't that much of a fan, but this is smack. But I, this is I've got the stories. I remember, you know, that Brit Awards. Mm -hmm. I remember the Glastonbury performance when she got off the stage. They recreate that performance. They also recreate the Grammys when she was performing in Camden because she wasn't allowed to fly to America, and she won five Grammy Awards on that night. And it's a it's a brilliant. Uh, recreation. Lots of stuff I didn't know. Stuff that maybe led to the addiction issues. Her nan dying, you know, being yeah. dumped by Blake, Blake going into prison. It all kind of, it's all part of this it does, unraveling. It sounds really tragic, but how often do we get immense creative talent like this ending up with their life either being taken advantage True. of and falling into a spiral of despair. And I, interestingly, on. think she is the last one. I think if we had someone going through similar issues now, they would be so micromanaged that I'm thinking okay. that because she was the last person of that kind of generation to have the almighty fall. The, the really tragic thing is she gets to the end of the movie and she's starting to get back on her feet. She'd stop drinking. Uh, yeah, I, do, do you know, that that is the familiar story. I mean, not totally unrelated, but they always said John Lennon was actually getting to his happiest yeah. just before he was shot. You know, he finally was, you know, he was finally a very happy person who was killed by a very unhappy person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's so often, I'm afraid, is, is is the irony and the tragedy of life. I've got to let you go. Okay. I'm sorry Lovely about that. Lovely to see you as always. I thought it was very important that we um, uh, caught up from Sydney. So thanks for being so tolerant. And I'll meet you in the street this <laughs> sometime next week. That sounds but so wrong, but we'll, yes, let's we'll, do we'll, it. We'll have you back. <laughs> we'll have you back. Now, coming, coming up, um, the Cabinet are going to consider voting, apparently, on... Sunak's smoking ban. Remember this? He's going to ban smoking. Is this what a Tory government should be doing? Or, to be honest, does it make sense? We'll be talking to the director of the Smokers Lobby Group to discuss that one. And after that, WhatsApp. Vicky Ford will be joining me to do that. 0344 499 1000 to be part of the conversation. This is Talk TV. Never mind the ballot. A brand new look at all things politics from The Sun with me, Harry Cole. Watch my big end of the week with no stone unturned. Every Thursday evening, exclusively with The Sun. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Welcome back. Angela Rayner has clearly not acted with integrity and honesty, uh, says Jane. She is an MP and is expected to hold certain standards. Well, we don't know for certain. That is the allegation. Um, and certainly the evidence looks uh, pretty steeped against her. Two houses, one married couple, one is, uh, couples. One is liable for CGT. It looks like she hung on to the house, so she didn't have to repay the 25% discount. This is because of the right to buy. Were they both getting 25% council tax discount? Discount? Legitimate question. There was a council grant, etc., etc. The the key points that are coming through here is look, it seems one rule for one, one rule for another. But also, as uh, Brad in Cambridge says, for me it's primarily the hypocrisy of Rayner. She not only wants to pull up the ladder now that she's bought her house to stop others, but she also doesn't want to be in the to be judged by the same standards that she set for others. At the moment, that's my main point of contention, contention with Angela Rayner on this one. Uh, but as I say, she's a very different type of politician. I think she made a huge mistake because even if she was sort of clean as anything in regards to her taxes, she should have come out and just said, the reason this has happened is because of X, Y and Z, and, you know, I cocked up or whatever. I think we would have all moved on by then. OK, cabinet ministers, at least three, we are told, plus an article recently from Boris Johnson as well, are considering voting against Rishi Sunak's flagship smoking ban on Tuesday. We are reliably informed. Other ministers are undecided on to whether to back the legislation before it goes to the Commons. And that means potentially a rebellion. Not many Tory MPs needed for a rebellion these days. Now, this is where the legal age at where people can purchase cigarettes will rise annually from the age of 18, effectively, mm. banning anyone currently aged 14 or younger from ever being able to buy cigarettes, caveat legally, or if your mum or dad or brother or sister, whatever, don't go and get them for you. And uh, disposable vapes will also be banned outright, while reusable ones will be limited, etc., etc. Is that why you have a Conservative government to ban things like this? Or what can your objection really be to trying to stop smoking? 0344 499 1000. Joining me to discover this is Simon Clark. No, not the cabinet or former cabinet minister, but the director of the smokers' lobby group Forest. Hi, Simon. I'm guessing um, you're hopeful that this legislation will go through. Uh, hello, Nick. Uh, hello. Well, we're strongly against this legislation. Oh, sorry. I got a completely <laughs> wrong brief from my team. OK. Uh, so... Yeah, no, we're strongly against it. Oh, because... yeah, you're from Forest, aren't you? That's right. We, we represent uh, adult smokers. And although this bill is not going to affect existing smokers, I mean, we think it's going to have 
a terrible impact on the nation generally. I mean, obviously, the vast majority of people don't smoke and I understand whether for that reason, many people maybe are not looking at this with any great interest. But the point is, we are going to infantilize future generations of adults. And I'm pretty sure that in 10 years time, uh, there will be moves to ban the sale of cigarettes and tobacco products, not just to uh, younger adults, but to adults of all ages. And we're going to create this ludicrous situation within the next few years where, for example, a 30 year old can buy uh, cigarettes and tobacco but a 29-year-old will be prohibited from doing the same thing. Well, legally, I mean, that... le legally, but you can also, as you know these days, get hold of counterfeit um, or illicit whites or whatever they're called now uh, and get hold of those uh, cigarettes which often are more harmful even than real cigarettes are harmful. Well, exactly. I mean, if you prohibit any le product that has been legal for decades, if not, you know, over 100 years, then you are clearly going to fuel a massive black market. I mean, we already have uh, huge difficulty in, in uh, preventing people getting hold of drugs that are already illegal. Mm -hmm. So basically adding another product to uh, that list of uh, illegal or illicit substances is utterly ludicrous. And it simply isn't going to work. And it is going to be counterproductive because it is going to create this huge black market. And of course, we all know that criminal gangs, illicit se uh, sellers, they don't care who they sell to. They're quite happy to sell to children. So potentially we're going to make the situation much worse. I, I went uh, undercover uh, during my time as an MP when there was the plain packaging row going on, which I declare I was one of a very full, few number of MPs who opposed the plain packaging for a number of reasons, right? not least because I didn't think it would work. But, you know, more, more on that another time. But I was watching undercover. I was in a van watching people turn up, do a quick transaction in the middle of anywhere. It could have been a, a, a housing estate. It could have been anywhere. There were there were news agents selling them under the counter, uh, illicit cigarettes. And who was buying them? It was 16 year olds. As Claire says to me from Paul, congratulations. rebellious and a status symbol. I can't imagine a more counterproductive policy. Is that the, the legitimate criticism of this, that younger people will perhaps be more attracted to it? Or, and let me ask you this, what's wrong with trying to stop people smoking? Well, I think we have to decide what type of society we want to live in. I think it's very disappointing this is happening under a Conservative government because I always thought the Conservatives were supposed to be on the side of freedom of choice and personal responsibility. I mean, it's very important we educate uh, young people, anybody, about the serious health risks associated with smoking. Nobody's denying that there are very serious health risks associated with smoking. But as long as people understand what they are, then once you're an adult at the age of 18, when you are legally an adult, you must be allowed to make decisions for yourself. You can't go through life expecting the government to always make decisions for you. Because in the future, is the government going to try and restrict how many units of alcohol we drink well, each week? Well, we do, we do have legal... Um, look, I'm, you're going to suspect I'm, I, my heart isn't in this, but we do <laughs> legally restrict, OK, uh, access to alcohol. Why not cigarettes? Yes, but we already restrict access to tobacco and cigarettes because the legal age at which you can sell tobacco or cigarettes is already 18, which is the legal sort of age at which you become an adult. And our argument is that if you're old enough to drive a car, join the army, possess a credit card, purchase alcohol, and of course you can vote at 18, uh, then you should be allowed to buy cigarettes and other tobacco products. I mean, it's hilarious to me that some of the MPs who are pushing this policy are the same people who want to reduce the voting age to 16. I mean, how can you possibly say that somebody can vote at 16 and choose our government, but in a few years' time, uh, they might be aged 24, 25, and they will not be allowed to make um, a, an informed decision to buy tobacco. And let's be honest, the sales of tobacco and smoking generally have been falling for decades. I mean, what, that's what makes this so bizarre that the government would introduce a policy like this at this particular time, because well, the smoking rates in all age groups...
crops are at their lowest ever recorded levels. So there's absolutely no reason to do this unless you're looking for some gimmick which I suspect Rishi Sunak is, he wants to leave a legacy. He knows he's going to be turfed out of office in a few months' time. He's desperate for a legacy. And that's why he suddenly announced this policy out of the blue at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester last year, because it's only a year ago that the government was saying that uh, this was too big a step to raise the age of sale, and they weren't planning to do it. And then a few months later, so, Richie Sunak suddenly announces he is going to do it. So, Why uh, would he? How's it? How's it going? How's it going to work, Simon? Effectively, so uh, uh, the law comes in, and then they pick a year, and anyone over the age of four, under the age of fourteen, can't buy cigarettes. Is and and, and what happens then? Because hey, the you you kind of grow with the legislation, don't you? The ban. Get, the longer the time goes on, the ban applies to more people. Yes, the plan is to introduce it in 2027. And of course, they keep banging on about 14-year-olds. But 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, it is currently illegal, it is already illegal to sell cigarettes to people of that age. So this has got nothing whatsoever to do with children. It's all about prohibiting young adults initially from buying cigarettes. And then, of course, as, as the years go by, eventually it'll be people who are in middle age who are prevented from buying cigarettes. I mean, it is a complete and utter but we are, nonsense. We are, am I right? We're going to have this ridiculous situation where someone could just have a year or two difference in age when they're, they're a lot older and one of them will be able to buy cigarettes and the other one won't. Yes. I mean, uh, people have been pointing out that if you are were born on 31st of December 2008, you'll be allowed to buy cigarettes. Uh, but if you're born on the 1st of January 2009, two days later, you won't. I mean, this is why this policy is not going to work. And what will happen within 10 years, even the anti-smoking lobby will say this policy isn't working. But rather than then abandoning the policy, they will say, let's just simply ban the sale of cigarettes to adults of all ages. I mean, we know that's going to that, happen. Wouldn't that be irony. more honest, though? Wouldn't that be more honest? I mean, I, I wouldn't like it, but it would be more honest to say, do you know what? We don't like smoking. That's what we stand for as a government. We're just going to ban it. Done. It'd be more honest, wouldn't it? To be more honest, but of course, in the real world, the government would immediately lose ten billion pounds of revenue from ah, the tax. On yeah, the you see, there's the catch, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is, and so no government is actually going to do that. And of course, the New Zealand government, uh, which uh, a Labour government in New Zealand introduced this legislation in New Zealand um, a year or two back, and then they lost office late last year. And the new centre-right coalition uh, government in New Zealand repealed the legislation only a few weeks ago. So it's utterly bizarre that we could have a situation where a Conservative government in the UK introduces a policy that has been rejected by a centre-right government in New Zealand and was introduced originally by a Labour uh, government. And yet in this country, if a number of Tory MPs do rebel, as indeed we hope they will, this government will be reliant on Labour votes to get one of their flagship policies through. I mean, how utterly ludicrous and embarrassing is that going to be for Rishi Sunak? I think on, I think on that note, we shall wait and see what happens. Thank you very much indeed, Simon Clark, a director of Smokers Lobby Group Forest, which, um, which just for the information of the team behind there, they are against the legislation, right? OK. God. I don't know. Yeah, pro smoking. Well done. We got that. Let's go to uh, David in Swindon. David, hello. Yeah, on the uh, well, like on your banner, it's a title smoking ban. Yes. I just got. To, I really got to correct you on talk. It's not a smoking ban. They sales ban. Okay. You've got a banner along there. Let, what do you think of the smoking ban? They're not banning smoking. 18-year-olds will still be able to smoke. It's a, if you look at the analogous one with the alcohol... Are you splitting hairs here because the 17-year-old no, won't be able no, to? No, 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 I'm not. They're all allowed right. to smoke. All right, all right. But you, you've got on the bottom of your banner... All right, OK, fine. Ban. But it's going to ban people from smoking. But it's going to take years. I mean, we've just had a really good example. Someone born on the 31st of December 2008 will yes, be able to purchase cigarettes and smoke, because you can't I smoke agree. without Logical. purchasing cigarettes.
No, but somebody can purchase them for you. Yes, it's well, that's a flaw in the law. I agree with that. Of course they alcohol. can. I could, I could buy yeah. a bottle of wine this afternoon yeah. and so, serve it to my 14-year-old yeah, uh, daughter. Well, it's the same with cigarettes. Well, you can buy cigarettes, but why do the cooks keep saying it's a smoking ban? Because it will ultimately, people. this government, right, believes yeah. that they are going to be able to ban people from purchasing cigarettes and therefore that's banning them from smoking. OK, that, that of yeah. course people are going to break the law, but for them it's a smoking ban. In reality, I'm with you all the way, they will be yeah. buying cigarettes from all sorts of people. Yeah, like abroad. <laughs> well, actually, it's not even abroad. Yeah. You know, you order them up, I tell you now, you, via the internet, I'm not promoting this or advocating yeah. it, you can get cigarettes produced in Poland, uh, you can get them imported from other European countries, yeah. And you can buy them just by ha having a little deal online and going and picking yeah. them up. I, I tell you, within well, within half a mile of you, there'll be someone ready with 200 cigarettes to do a deal yeah. for you at half yeah. the price yeah. that you're paying in the shops. Well, I agree with you. I, I think it should be. It's either an outright ban. It's either yeah, good it, or bad. It, it would be more and honest, wouldn't it? It, it would, would be more be. honest. Yeah. Now, listen, Thank I think you, you also... Did you want to talk about Angela Rayner? No, no, I moved on from that. Oh, now. have you? <laughs> OK, all right. <laughs> Lovely. That was, okay, then. That was Thanks, Dave, then. David in Swindon. He's had enough of Angela Rayner. Have you had enough of Angela Rayner? Again, I am asking you how important this is to you. I think it's a different angle from just saying, you know, is she awful, etc., etc. I've only had two or three messages saying, uh, when it comes to Angela Rayner, um, do you know, we think it is important for lots of very legitimate reasons. Uh, uh, sorry, I've had lots of messages saying that, but only one or two saying they don't think it is important. And I would love to hear from you more if you didn't think it was and explore that with you 0344 499 1000 the number for that I'm also asking and I I know it's not right there at the top of the news but I think that's more because of some of the domestic politics we've got the Iranian Revolutionary Guard have seized an Israeli linked ship this is a retaliatory action we are told to Israel taking out um, uh, leaders of an is, 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 is um, a pro-Iran, anti-Israel group, uh, some who led the attack uh, in Hamas or gave the order for the attack in Hamas as well. This is an escalation and it should affect, it should, you know, it does worry me. Now the professionals are saying they think what has happened today, the seizing of this boat, is a proportionate response, but it can easily get out of hand. Are you actually worried about escalation? of the Middle East crisis or between Iran and Israel. I mean, if you say, well, is it going to affect me? Well, if it escalates, it could obviously affect you. But but actually, even on Friday, the stock markets collapsed. And for those of you who are saying in, in America, they just they, they dropped something like nearly 2%. Does that affect you? Yes, it affects you whether it's on your pension, uh, because you know when the stock markets collapse and they lose confidence, that comes back and hurts uh, just in as that as one example then it's about getting goods transported around the world you've got the Suez Canal down in the region all sorts of implications we don't need another shock do we are you worried about the potential of the escalating threat in the Middle East and if so why let me know why 0344 499 1000 still want a whatsapp voice message come on let me have one love to hear from you uh, on that or the subject of you know how important to you uh, is the uh, attacks and criticism on Angela Rayner. Does it matter to you? 0344 499 1000. Uh, coming up afterwards, we'll be talking about WhatsApp. I'll be joined by Vicky Ford. WhatsApp, it seems, um, not really troubled about having lots of youngsters on their social media chat group. However, teachers, parents, I think should be quite worried about them reducing the age from use of WhatsApp from 16 to 13. What do you say? How vulnerable are our children to social media apps? 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, 
not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Quite like this. Nick, let me get this right. The PM wants to stop people smoking but cannot stop people illegally entering our country. So, at 18, you can die for this country but cannot have a fag while being shot at. The sooner Sunak, I'm going to paraphrase here, goes away, the better, says Neil in Swansea. I mean, he's got a point really, hasn't he? Uh, let me know your thoughts on the smoking ban. I think it's a ban, even after the last phone call we had, which I appreciated. Uh, and of course, on Angela Rayner, which has got lots of you talking. 03444 991000. Maggie, hello. Hello. Hi, and how are you? And what would you like to talk about? Um, I'd like to talk about uh, why Angela Rayner is being so vilified by the Tory press. OK. When they've got plenty they could vilify in the Tory cabinet and the Tories per se. OK, so you just... Well, well, you tell me what you think. I don't want to presume what you think. Is, 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 do you just think it's unfair? I do think it's unfair, yes, because we don't know at this stage whether or not she kept £500 or some amount, and yet <laughs> honours were given to Mansour, an Egyptian, yep. because he donated millions yep. to the Tory well, party. Well, by, by the way, I have to be clear here, the, the, it's, it looks like that, but there is no direct link. There's, you know, there's no... It would be a crime if there was. There's no direct link. Oh. That, here you go, five million... Well, I'm just being clear for, for, no, for fact. No, okay? I um, but, but, yeah, it kind of looks pretty fishy. You're right, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, yes, an understatement. Yes, but he's not the only one, no. is he? No. There have been several occasions... Uh, I, I mean, the honours and all that is just, well... It's the most ridiculous thing, I think. And um, the fact that they get what the Lords get, £376 just for... Yeah, I mean, we're going slightly off subject. But, but 
why are we vilifying this one lady who is the one who usually says what she thinks? I would hardly say that she's really... I, I just, okay. I just so, find it amazing. Well, let I me ask you this question. It's a distraction. If she was a Tory... Tory and, yeah. and you know, this Tory press, they go for Tories. I mean, in your heart, you know that. I mean, just look how they finished off uh, Sahawi and other MPs, right? They did. Yes, yes. OK, so if she was a Tory, would you be rigging me up and saying the same thing? Possibly not if I'm... <laughs> well, that's I'm honest not, of you. I'm, I appreciate I'm, I'm that. No, I probably wouldn't. It's just that it's reached a pitch now when when I go to get my paper... And I buy the eye. I don't buy any Tory press. But it, I look at the titles of the others and I watch the press previews. So I'm a bit of a politics fiend. Oh, good. Fiend. Oh, good. I'm glad to find and, another and, one. <laughs> and I just find it just sickening, really. But do you feel you can... I mean, in this day and age, you see, like, you, I'm really pleased you phoned up because I've all the other phone calls have been um, very, uh, very... giving their reasons why they... They think Angela deserves a, a good pasting. And, and I, my position's very clear. I, I've actually said I think she is an exceptional politician. She cuts through. But I'm, I think she's been rank hypocrisy. That's where you and I are going to differ. How can she, on the one hand, demand the standards of transparency from Tory MPs who are under scrutiny for tax and yet refuse to give that transparency herself? Well, yes, uh, I would have thought... Yeah, maybe that she should. Um, but to me, they've picked on her. They found something. Yeah, and, and I agree. Really, I agree. They're, they're they delighted they found her. something. Yeah. Here, let's move the subject on a little bit, Maggie, with you, if I may, here, because I think we are, as we get closer to the election, and as Labour look more and more and more likely to be the ones in power very soon. I think they're going to get more and more scrutiny here. I think you're going to see more coming out. And that's legitimate, isn't it? Well, it is, because that's the way we operate in this country. But I do find that when the Tory press come out en masse, which they will, um, it's the same disaster that happened with Brexit because you've got Johnson, who's just a narcissist and therefore wasn't in... He just wanted... But hang on, you're just vilifying people now and yet no, you criticise people for... Vil knows, but everybody knows the man is a liar. But because of all the coverage um, the Tory press gave because they wanted Brexit, why no, this is all going to come out and it will get dirty and nasty... You'd think mm. we were a little more civilised. Well, I, I do. I Look, I think it's very toxic, OK? And yeah. unfortunately, the, the, the politicians are doing it to themselves. Yeah. When I was in Parliament nine years ago, I thought it was pretty tough, but it wasn't toxic like this. And that's a shame. Listen, great call. Thank you, Maggie. I really appreciate you putting another point of view over. Let's go to Darren in Bristol. Hello, Darren. Yeah, hi there. Hello. Uh, I'd just like to say, yeah. uh, why is Angela Rayner getting vilified for this? Uh, £3,500 when the Tories have been sticking their finger in the pie for absolutely years and just taking so much money of our money for the country. So is the point for you, it's the amount of money that she may have done some wrongdoing with that matters, not the principle that every pound counts, and that was her words, not, not mine. No, but also the principle is uh, the Tories, they're just, they always take and never give. And well, she mm -hmm. might have made a mistake, perhaps, uh, but she is willing to step down and to say, OK, that's it. Well, if she's but, guilty, if she's guilty, and, and we must stress yeah, that. Yeah, if she's guilty, of but, course. But you say, you say that. Well, what do you mean the Tories only take? If you mean as policy... They've spent more money than Labour ever have. I mean, it's like a, a Labour government, uh, the way they're spending money. Yeah, how much money have they all taken from their, uh, the purses of the 
government and put in their own little pocket. Well, how many do you think? There's 650 MPs, there's a, oh, I don't know, I'm going to about 380 Tories, I, I'm not sure, but whatever. How many, how many of that, say, 380 Tories have taken money personally and put it in their pockets from, well, I'm not sure where you think it's from, but how many do you think? Well, I think the, most, the majority of them, they're just looking out for themselves. But how, how, give, me an, give me an example of sufficient scale for you to say the majority of them. So you're talking about 200-plus well, MPs. Just, um, no, no, no. If I could argue with you at the moment, yeah, do. not argue with you at the moment, oh, okay. they, they're all looking out to line their own pockets. I, but I'm asking you how. I never found a way to do that. Not that I was looking, but but how? I know there have been some people who have dished out contracts to other people during COVID under highly yeah, 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 but that's, that's like my, yeah. that's about two or three. <laughs> well, two or three, yeah, and they all got friends. No, sorry, They're you're all saying all the MPs. Well. What, what you're saying, okay, Dan? Okay, look, I, no, I'm not going to argue with you. It's, I just put in my. I'm not arguing. Across. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. And really, whether your claim that the, uh, there are people with their hands in the till, I totally accept that. But you're yeah. claiming it's like 200 plus, and I'm saying, how can you make that claim? It's uh, be honest. You're just guessing, aren't you? Mm, I wouldn't be guessing. I'd be surmising. On what facts, though? Just the fact that two or three we have, have, have got links to people who've had good contracts? Look, I'm not trying to defend them all. And why I'm having the conversation with you, and it's certainly not to have an argument, is that I think it's very easy to talk a narrative uh, like, yeah. like you're doing. And actually, when it's challenged, I'm not sure it's that. It's like me saying to you, every police officer is corrupt. Now, there are corrupt police officers. But I tell you now, and I hope you'd agree, not every police officer is corrupt, and I think that's true. Oh of no, MPs. no, no! I would never say that. No, but I, I, but I'm saying it's true of MPs as well. Yeah. Okay, Darren. You thank get you. You get your good, you get your bad, but yeah, yeah. I think we can agree on that. It seems to be bad at the moment. Yeah. Well, it feels like that. I totally agree with you. And now we're about to talk to one of those MPs, who I'm sure is not bad actually no we're not apparently the line has gone down maybe they haven't paid their maybe they haven't paid their bill <laughs> uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to get some. listen thank you darren for that let's go to amy in cardiff um that was my mistake i saw i saw vicky ford's name up on the line so uh we're apparently having some technical issues there uh but let's talk to amy it gives me the pleasure of talking to amy in cardiff hello hi it's about angela Rainer. yes people are forgetting that she was a single mom prior to getting married for the second time. OK, you've, you've the got the advantage on me, but I do remember that, yeah. Yeah, the first relationship didn't work out, and by media reports, it was a terrible relationship, so she needed to get out of it. She kept, to me, it's clear, she kept that second home. She needed a bolt hole somewhere. She didn't know if a second marriage was going to work out. It was new. She had young babies, and to me, she needed a bolt hole where she could escape if things didn't work out. Money aside, forget about the money. I truly believe that it was because of the terrible time she'd had, her previous experiences, she needed to know that she had somewhere safe that she could take her babies if that second marriage didn't work out. Amy, that's entirely credible, uh, and I have no idea, and I can certainly understand the need for a bolt hole, but that doesn't really explain, and I don't think you can dismiss it by saying forget the money, because that doesn't really explain why she, when she sold it, where there's no threat presumably anymore, she just yeah. may not have declared it properly. So it could be error, it could yeah. be oversight, it could be malicious. I think that's the difference. Nothing wrong yeah. with keeping two houses. Think, you just yeah, have to pay think, your tax. To me, I think it was just oversight. But she just wanted to make sure it was a new marriage and because of the previous experience that she'd had, she wanted to make sure that she was 100% sure that okay. you know, Amy? everything was going to be OK. For, for time reasons only, I'm very appreciate. I think you've got your say. You've put, certainly given some food for thought there for some people. You can join the conversation 0344 four, double nine one thousand. But I'm very pleased to say uh, we've got Vicky Ford, Conservative MP for Chelmsford on the line. Vicky, welcome. Good afternoon, Nick. Now, now, the good news is I'm not going to ask you about Angela Rayner. I've been doing that all afternoon. We've had some great calls on it because we've invited you on to talk about 
WhatsApp and uh, social media. No, more... Just before we start, Nick, you are going to talk I'm about Angela Rayner. Having Raynor. a technical issue on your side, getting connected, not on my side. And I overheard you saying a quick cheat joke that maybe Vicky Ford doesn't pay. Uh, her uh, phone. Uh, no, Vicky, that I was really in good context. I pay them from my own money. I don't expense them. I think it's incredibly important that MPs are responsible, the vast majority of them are, and I hope I fit into your good MP camp. Okay? Well, I, 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 even, I even, had you heard everything mind. correctly, you would have said, you would have heard me say exactly that in the context. So forgive me if my poor humour uh, caused you any uh, concern there, but shall we move on? Yes, please. Let's it's talk, an let's, issue. let's talk WhatsApp. Now, yeah. the, the, the thing that's prompted this conversation yeah. is that WhatsApp essentially say you have to be 16 and over to use their social media app, which we know just about everyone is using who can use it, including lots of MPs, as, as, we, as we know, uh, for, for good reasons. But they're reducing the age limit through which you can use it to 13. Now, I know this only means ticking a box, but it strikes me that when you've got teachers, when you've got parents, when you've got considerable worries about uh, impact of social media on kids' well-being, on, on their mental health as well, mm -hmm. I'm concerned that these guys are under no control whatsoever. They can just do what they like, and you, government and others, are powerless to stop them. Should we be worried that dropping the age to 13 is just, um, if you like, two fingers to responsible use of social, social media? I'm concerned that this is an extremely irresponsible thing of a meta. It's the company that own WhatsApp, Facebook and others have done by dropping the age from 16 to 13. So first of all, we know that you know social media can be OK for many kids, but for some kids it can be extremely damaging and the content that they can see can be very damaging. And there's a particular issue with WhatsApp because WhatsApp messages are what they're called end-to-end -end encrypted. So even WhatsApp itself cannot see the messages that are exchanged, whereas That's at right. the moment on Facebook and other technologies they can, which means that illegal content cannot be uh, removed from the WhatsApp system. So we have... Um, change the law to make uh, a lot of content that children were seeing illegal and um, to make it much stronger that social media companies need to remove that harmful content for children mm. um, that includes but it's content. it's a bit it's always a bit late but isn't it on whatsapp even the social media company can't see it mm. and so these are often quite harmful content can be shared from adults to children or between children without any policing, including illegal content. So for WhatsApp to have decided unilaterally without consulting with anybody that it's absolutely fine now to have the age of children from the age of 13 using their platform is, in my view, very irresponsible. I know many children do use this platform, but I would really warn parents and children, anything you see on WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. It cannot be seen by the police. It cannot be seen by WhatsApp. And so illegal... But, but it's here to stay, Vicky, it's, sorry to interrupt you, but it's here to mm. stay. In mm. reality, what can we do about it? Because teachers, I'm, I'm guessing, and you, 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 mm. you know, this is a, a matter close to your heart. I know you're a member of the Education mm. Select Committee. Mm -hmm. Uh, teachers have enough trouble with phones and social media and bullying as a result of it could be going online, for example, on a WhatsApp. Uh, it'd be, yeah. You can even make your messages disappear, I think, quite quickly after you've sent it. So, so, but, but I do feel that there's a need for us either to acknowledge a sense of powers, powerlessness or, and I say this as, a, I think, a libertarian um, a, a yeah. heart, conservative, or actually, we've got to somehow get a bigger grip on these companies. So there, there are some things that are in place right right now and that have changed quite recently. The laws that we brought in through the Online, Online Safety, Safety Act. Act. Yes. Yeah. Um, that is going to mean that if social media bosses, you know, knowingly turn a blind eye to seriously harmful content being 
sent to children. And actually, the bosses themselves can end up being prosecuted as criminals and being sent to court. So that was a big campaign that we ran. Um, some of us thought the bill was going to get the stronger controls over the social media bosses. And that will work on, on a lot of these different platforms. But there is a particular issue with this end-to-end encrypted content that you know, Facebook, Meta, the organization that owns the WhatsApp will say, but I didn't even know because it was being shared on an encrypted service. So I think more needs to be done. I think this announcement by Meta is hugely irresponsible. But also, Nick, I often say, you know, you, know, you can't just do one thing and then think that's going to be the end of the battle here to keep children safe online. I, I take the analogy that if we want to keep children safe when they're crossing the road, we didn't have, ever do one thing. We had a huge range of things, you know, making cars safe and making roads well, safe. Well, you can. So, so the law has changed to have this target to social media companies, which they will need to comply with. That law is going through the process of being implemented right now. I would like to see uh, stronger measures, um, including um, controls that at the time you buy a phone, you get asked, what age is the person who's going to be using this phone? And if you're buying a phone for a child, that it comes with advice on all the parental controls that you sure, can use to switch the content Vicky, off. Vicky, so I have to interrupt you on that point because... Yeah. I was there when int uh, legislation was introduced to restrict, for example, the buying of knives. You're going to get it. Whatever legislation you guys in government bring forward, there's a way around it. It's either through the internet, it's through rogue traders, not enough people enforcing it. Yeah. Those are ineffective measures at the end of the day, particularly when it comes to phones. Someone else just goes and buys it for them, for example. Someone else can go... But, but what I speak to, uh, you know, technology to try and keep children safe or is improving as well. But speaking to a lot of parents, they say, I'm not aware of the parental controls. So my point is, how do we improve the parental awareness on these parental controls? How do we make sure that the phones, for example, could come with parental controls switched on so that you don't have to actively go into your phone and have them switched off? Okay. There are various groups recently who've been saying these phones shouldn't be sold for children's use at all. And I have actually a lot of empathy with that as well. And as I said, Nick, this is going to be a constant... Well, let's hit them where it hurts then. Keep children Let, safe. Let's hit them where it hurts then. I don't know, you may well know this as a member of the Select Committee, mm. but we're constantly told about the huge impact social media has on the mental health of young children. I cannot pick, I cannot go through a day when I'm hearing of some story more impact of mental health on youngsters. Mm -hmm. Let if it is connected to social media and you guys in parliament are so convinced of that, let's hit them with the bill to improve our mental health services. Let's slap the fines down on them until they take it seriously. Well, I think these measures that, that we we have to do a number of different measures, and that's the first time Nick that that suggested to me. But it's not a bad suggestion. I'll certainly look at it. One of the first measures that we were asked to do was particularly look at the impact of online pornography on young people, um, and that is a, the first thing that will come through as a result of this new online safety bill is a ban on providing that to all young people. But, the, you know, as we all know, the online world is changing all the time and we need to... And, and I think legislators, by definition, measures. are behind the curve all the time, Vicky, which well, is half of the problem. Anyway, listen, thanks for joining us. I'm sorry about the technical issues beforehand, but shedding some light on Parliament's view uh, on this issue of not just WhatsApp, but social media. You can join the conversation after the next break. 0344 for double nine one thousand. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Right, just before we go to uh, Chris in the Isle of Wight, Nick, whether Angela Rayner is innocent or guilty, I will not be voting Labour because of her. I do not think she is suitable to be Deputy Prime Minister of the sixth biggest economy in the world. I thought we were fifth. Have we been relegated? I know we're the fourth largest exporter now of services. She does not have the right qualities. Why on earth did Keir Starmer pick her? He didn't. She was elected. It's a very interesting role in the Labour Party. The Deputy Leader is actually elected. He doesn't have any say. Rachel Reeves or Harriet Harm would be far more suitable. Thank you for that, Sue. Um, Angela Rayner has clearly not acted with integrity and honesty. She is an MP and is expected to hold a certain standard. Two houses, one married couple. One is liable for CGT. It looks like she shunk, hung on to the house so she didn't have to pay the discount. Um, I mean, there's more on that theme. Um, uh, just a comment on the reports from Sydney here from Don. How shocking it is to read that someone has actually stabbed a baby, let alone adults, you know, were drugs involved in this? Well, I think possibly we will find out more information. Uh, we will find out uh, more information uh, as and when we can. Nick, why vilify WhatsApp for allowing the pushing of ideological dangerous ideas when your average 13 year old girl is taught she could be a boy by a teacher in a classroom? It's odd MPs get annoyed about a tech firm that sit idly on their hands when the same dangerous material is pushed in a school, says Chris in Newbury. Let's go to uh, Chris in the Isle of Wight. Hello, Chris. Hi. Oh, good afternoon, Nick. And welcome to the show. Oh, yeah. yeah, right. The, the issue with WhatsApp, and yes. obviously earlier on in the week there was a discussion about banning children from mobile phones. Yeah. Right. The, the issue is, is schools send children home with iPads and tablets. Yeah, they do so indeed, they you're do, right. So that they can do their homework. And it was only um, a couple of months ago, actually, um, my 10-year-old niece, um, she did her homework, and, and I looked at her homework, and I thought, well, you've got a couple of questions wrong. 
few bits wrong with it. So, and I, and, and I, was, I was round at my ex-sister-in-law's house um, because whenever I go up to Nottingham, I, I stay You do the homework, obviously. <laughs> well, well, no, I make sure the kids do the homework. Cool. I was actually looking after the children uh, while my ex-sister-in-law was at work. Um, and anyway, and I thought, right, well, because I'm actually a qualified teacher, I thought, right, well, there's no point in the child doing the work giving the wrong answers and then sort of getting praise for getting it wrong. No, you know no, I mean? absolutely. Because they're, yep. always, they're always going to get it wrong. Yeah. So I, I sat down while, whilst the 10-year-old went to bed. And I sat down and I went on the iPad. And I'm like, well, she's got WhatsApp on here. Why has she got WhatsApp? She's 10 years old. Why the hell is this on the WhatsApp? school iPad or on her this phone? This was on the school iPad. That my 10-year-old niece had downloaded it onto the school iPad. Blimey. So the school aren't putting blocks on their own devices. This is a school issue iPad, not my niece's yes, own Yes, I hadn't iPad. thought of that. I'd be very interested if anyone else has a similar experience there, actually, whether the schools have done and that. Apparently, apparently the, school, the school can only block certain things. They, they can block YouTube. But they can't block WhatsApp. You see, I, 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 I've, I've got an iPad. It's right in front of me now. I don't, I can't get the WhatsApp app on here, but I can have WhatsApp online. I don't think they've got an app anymore for iPad. But you can go online, and once you're online, if the school, I would have thought the school could either block that or not. That's when you can get WhatsApp. On my iPad, I'm see, not able to get the app per se. She, she had WhatsApp in a form on the iPad because I was like looking yeah. and she she was talking to the next door neighbour's child who was only six. Which is crazy. Who's also, who's also got... And, and how are parents... Because the easy answer is parents should know what's going on, but how can they all the time? I mean, at, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm quite switched on when it mm. comes to sort of monitoring kids because obviously I'm a teacher. Mm. But it's a case of... Not many parents. All they think is, right, the child's done the homework, that's it. Oh, yes, you can play a game on it because you're the, the kids can have a couple of games on the iPad as well. And they're just thinking the child's playing on a game on the laptop, or on the iPad, sorry. Mm. And they're not. They're WhatsApping each other. There you go. Thank you for that, Chris, right, in the Isle of Wight. To the, the, the schools need to do something about it. Yes, no, I, I, think, I think you've made your point. They need to be able to block it or not that's the that's the key if they can't do it then i think they should be telling the parents because you're basically giving them a computer uh, which presumably normally the parents would be in control of or at least have some say on thank you chris in isle of wight let's go to martin in exeter hello martin hello Hi. um just a quick one i'd like uh, yes. perplexing me i've sadly had to pay capital gain tax in the uh, past well it does mean you had a capital gain i suppose indeed and it's 25 percent so tell me yeah. when the profit on the house is 48 grand how are we always talking about 1500 quid i make that thirteen thousand quid well i don't know do they still have capital gains allowances for inflation so uh, uh, so yeah, all of not that. that much not that because let's say it was 1500 pounds she wouldn't have done it you only do this sort of thing for i'm not saying she's guilty yeah but no. you only do it for large about it's not, a, it's not a large wodge in that sense when you've just pocketed a 48 grand profit. If you make 48 grand profit, yes, you get capital allowances, which I think back then were sort of maybe six grand. Let's be generous. That's assuming she hadn't made any other capital gains that year. But no way can you get to 15. It's a really now. good point because I was calculating it. I paid capital gains tax as well. And by the way, <laughs> watch, watch Angela Rayner's government when they get into power. They'll be whopping that one up for you. I can tell you that much. Um, uh, it, it'll, be, um, it'll, be, it, it'll be interesting to see how they got to the calculation. I mean, as it happens, separately aside, the left, the left will always say that you're, it's unearned money, capital gains like on a house, and you should therefore pay more tax on it. They never take into account the fact that there's house inflation. You know, you, your net gain, actually, if you've had a house for 20 years or even five years in the last five years, is never going to be as big as it sounds in real terms, is it? Oh, I totally agree. But mm. 
the, the, the everybody keeps saying, oh, it's only fifteen hundred pounds. It's only fifteen hundred pounds. I, I, I'd like somebody to tell me how it's because if if you, if you can get, only pay fifteen hundred pounds on forty eight grand profit, tell me because I'd like to do it. Okay, listen, Martin, I've got to go. Thank you for your call. Um, we could have talked capital gains for hours. Briefly, very briefly, but I'm pleased to fit in Cindy from Michigan. Hello, Cindy. Hello, good to speak with you. And I have to say, I love your show, love your show. Yo, I, I love you more. That's time. lovely to hear. Thank you. Uh, well, that that's not even possible because you remind me, your face reminds me of Paul McCartney. Okay, I, I can live with this. Keeps, put Cindy through first time every time she comes on. Thank you. <laughs> OK, Cindy, just for time reasons only, you must call early in the future. Tell me, what, 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 what's on your mind? I want to say that these, these, the, we, there are so many teardrops in, in a bucket that we could fit. The, the American people and the people from the UK, I feel, have just resigned themselves to just not trusting politicians. You're right. Period. It's a huge problem. Period. Is it not like that in the bucket. States? They're overflowing. It's oh, it's so like this. It's it's worse. It, it's just it's left and right. It's all it is. It's all we ever hear. Al allegations. You can't trust them. It's always to do with money and uh, votes. You oh, know, Cindy, it's, it's, I am so sorry that we can't we, talk longer. Will you I, will you please call in earlier in the future because I, I have will, to I have I, to I bring the conversation to an end. You've got to call in earlier. Just ask for Paul McCartney. It won't be a problem. That was Cindy. Trisha Goddard is coming up at the top of the hour. Hello, Trisha. Hi. Did you I hear that? that? Did you hear that? I did. Oh, good. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I love Cindy in Michigan. Uh, so we're doing lots of things, of course, after Rishi Ch uh, Sunak. Oh, God, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. What you do? That's our fun bit. But we're also looking at Donald Trump, who's uh, failed in trying to get out of appearing mm, in court. Big day, tomorrow. isn't it? big day and we look at the political uh the the legal ramifications of oj simpson's death um as well uh we're looking at tech news and you've covered a little bit of it that as well uh the two and a half thousand arrests under the vagrancy law that was brought in after post napoleonic times um all of that bradford and uh, our question of the day about can young people still make friendships because it's been suggested. brilliant question brilliant question that's uh, friendship should be put back on the school curriculum can young people still make friends that's coming up with trisha goddard that is going to be a great show at the top of the hour thanks to my team producer sarah devine who's been pulling her hair out there i know we've had